This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of the world-famous Comedy Cellar, coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Comedy, formerly Raw Dog, and available as a podcast and on YouTube. Dan Natterman here, a comedian, regular at the Comedy Cellar. Some would say underutilized at the Comedy Cellar, but that's a story for another day. Who would say that? I would say that. <laughs> uh, Noam Dorman, of course, the owner of the Comedy Cellar, who is not directly involved in the booking, so... Uh, so uh, I'm you know. more involved than you think. I just have plausible deniability. Okay, well, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, we have Perry Ashenbrand with us, and she is uh, she's a producer. She does some on air uh, stuff as well, and, and she's not involved. In Go ahead, sorry. And she is sort of a foil, if you will. Um, and that's her role, I think, on the show. If I were to characterize it, and we have with us a guest that has been. Uh, I don't know, quite a few months, I think, in the, in the making, trying to get this. More than that, years. Go ahead. Well, uh, Dave really? Smith is, yeah. well, Dave Smith is with us. Dave Smith is a libertarian, comedian, or comedian libertarian. I don't know what you would prefer to list first, but. Either's fine. A host of Part of the Problem podcast. Maybe you want to list that first. He's a podcaster, a very, very well-known one. Wow, 400,000 followers on Twitter. That's uh, that's a lot. They, anyway. They did nothing. Th this promises to be. Uh, I think uh, hopefully um, a um, a debate where everybody gets along, but I think there's going to be a lot of disagreement. In any case, uh, Noam. Uh, all right, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Second of all, I want to clear the air because you were very unfair to me. I sound like Trump. You're very unfair. You're very unfair to me, but I don't. I don't think it was intentional. But I, but for your audience, I want to clear the air. So I I went and got the little clip of what I what it is that I'd said about you. I don't know if you've ever seen it to this day. Uh, so I want. Yeah, I responded to you on on Twitter. Well, you said that you said that I was self self uh, absorbed or something like that. Yeah. Well, let me let I me play it. Let me play something that. like that. Yeah, but but let me play the clip because now I'll just give a little background on this clip. I don't I mean, like to talk. E One second. I don't even like. You got to play it on the screens too here, so we can see it. I don't even like to talk about such things as we talk about on this thing. Dan has some sort of passive aggressive tick. <laughs> where he will literally bring up something which he knows is uncomfortable for me <laughs> because I don't even like to talk about um, people uh, like in the comedy world on the show. It's not something I'm comfortable with. And you will see on this thing, you don't know me well, but you'll see, but she'll recognize it, these long pauses where I close my eyes and I'm trying to say, what can I say here to not, you know, to be careful. So good. This is we now. This is when I just got back from Vegas. I saw the legions of Legion of Skanks. I don't know if you were there. I was. I was there. And I was extremely impressed. And I like told said over and over like. And by the way, I'm also responsible. You don't know this for the fact that um, Min Comedy was live streaming you guys. I'm the one who talked them into it because I thought. That you, you know, I recognize you guys have a great following. So anyway, so Dan brings up Legion of Skanks. So go ahead, play. Is it at zero? I always get confused because I screenshot it. Yeah, go ahead. Play it. Anything? Is there a through line? Well, I don't want to get it wrong because if you get it wrong, you can be accused of um, saying something bad about them, which is the, the last thing I'd ever want to do because I'm so impressed with what they've accomplished. But I th I think it's a Rogan-y yeah, so what are they? group. A lot of these yeah. guys are on Rogan all the time, mm -hmm. which is... Um, <clears throat> that's, that's, a, that's a wide net... Um, First of all, they uh, they say they're not woke, right? They say a lot of things that 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 you're not not supposed to say. They're politically kind of libertarian, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't know if that applies to all of them, but definitely applies to some of them. Um, and uh, I'd say that the audience is mostly male. At least it was mm -hmm. in Vegas. Um, you know. I don't, I don't Who know. are the main skanks? It's, it's Big J Ogerson, Ari Shafir, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I, I um, Louis Gomez. I think he. I, think uh, I can answer that for you. Oh, okay. Louis Gomez, Ari Shafir. Go ahead, Mike. Who? Mike. It's uh, Legion of Skanks is their podcast. It's Dave Smith, Louis Gomez, and uh, Big J Ogerson. Dave Smith, by the way, is somebody I, I wanted to have on this podcast. I, I don't know if he has any interest in doing it. Uh, he is a comic that has become sort of a political guy. Now, can you pause it there for just one second? Uh, I mean, there's a few. Dave Smith, I think, is angry at me. Now, now, Dan knows that I had already felt that you were angry. Dan knows this. He, I've said it to him before. So, so when he brings that up, it's not naively. He knows now <laughs> I have to say this. So go ahead, continue. Go ahead, continue. <laughs> continue. Yeah. Why? Because. Now look at me struggling. Like, you don't use them. No, don't don't stop it. Would you use them? Should you Listen, use them? This is the thing. These guys. These guys. Are, I mean, humans. What am I trying to say? Well, there are some. There are some people out there who 
when we had a chance to book them, mm -hmm. we didn't book them. And we got that wrong in some way or right and the, and it's the reality has changed and and some of them have become very big so dave smith is somebody that uh we did look at and for whatever reason <clears throat> we didn't book him a huge miss huge 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 well, miss. But, but, but i and i fear i feel like these guys no matter no matter what have a little right. bitterness towards the place towards me towards sd i don't know and that's that's unfortunate because you know i'm i'm quite admiring of of all of them okay so that's what i said mm -hmm. huge miss it's actually the way i felt i admired you guys no end i was big up in you guys i do feel and then i'll respond that listen there's a story i wish i should have brought the video there's a bill grunfest who used, was, used to be the mc at the cell tells a story that bob dylan you know my father used to never let bob dylan play at his coffee shop mm -hmm. <laughs> and and then bob dylan became a huge star and then bob dylan used to come in periodically to the olive tree just to rub it in my father's face <laughs> that he was a big star. <laughs> that mean that, and, and the point of that was that even though he was Bob fucking Dylan, it still bugged him that my father got there wrong. So I always felt that anybody that I, that for whatever reason got passed on, and I don't even remember what it was. I just remember that, it, it, that, that you didn't perform here and then you stopped coming for whatever reason. And maybe you got way better. Who the fuck knows? You know, maybe we just got it wrong. Right. Um, that that's human, that it bugs anybody. It would bug me, you know? And, and I felt, always felt like that you probably were just like, fuck him, he didn't book me when he had the chance. And, I, and that's human to me. And that's why you can see, I was saying like, I, I, it's a human thing, but I admire these guys and we got it wrong. Like, I get it, you know? So go ahead. Oh, well, I, listen, I wasn't like furious about it or nothing. I didn't feel like you were like, like horrifically insulting me or something. But I do, I guess I um like, that what it seemed like you were saying was there's like, oh, yeah, Dave is is bitter toward me and resents me for over a decade ago, me not passing him at the cellar, which is just not true. And I've never said anything like that. I've never like publicly brought up that I was upset about this. And I have a lot of flaws, uh, far too many to list. But I genuinely I'm not one of those guys. I'm not like a bitter. I, and there's a lot of that in comedy, like a lot of comedians who are very kind of like um uh, kind of like feel wronged and yeah. bitter and resentful. And I hate that. That's not me at all. So I kind of felt like you were publicly saying I am that guy. Where And the truth is I'm I'm a very grateful person. Um, it's something I, I work very hard on being. Um, but like I have a great family and I love my job and I make so, good so money me, at me, it. And I feel very blessed. I'm in the top 1% of like the most blessed that's people. That's nothing. I'm top so, 0.1%. Well, there you go. <laughs> You might, I, I, all I right, order two points to you. But let me, but but I, let me, so, add, let me so that's hold, hold on, hold on. Let me just add something to the, some fact to this thing. I didn't, so the, the only reason I thought that was because over the years, I think even before, we'd reached out to you to say, does he want to come on the show? And we never got an answer. And I always figured, well, I own the comedy seller. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, president, uh, whoever, but like, you know, you feel he would just write back yes or no. And I always felt like, well, the fact that he was ghosting me meant, indicated to me that he was, pissed but that, well yeah i mean but i could be wrong about well i, I mean obviously i am wrong I, I, I take you what you were no i mean i'm not saying i'm i've never been pissed uh <laughs> i'm saying <laughs> i'm not pissed off that you didn't book me uh, the, uh, the truth is when and this was over 10 years ago i just didn't have a great set when yeah. i auditioned and that's that i was uh there, there are people who uh could probably tell you about this but i was with that night that i was kind of like Ah, I, I just didn't have a great set, and that happens. We've all like been in that situation before, so I didn't. I don't hold any. But look, you still perform at that. clubs. You've never come back to perform here. I'd be yeah. happy. I'd be happy to have you perform here. And for all these well, reasons, of course you would now. Well, that's exactly. So for all these reasons, no, it's not. It's, I mean, you, you're wrong if you think it's because you're famous now. No, 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 no. no. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm just joking yeah, around. Yeah, no, obviously, lots yeah. of people have been passed here who don't. Well, have but any, when you uh, say fame. that you you got it wrong, you're basing that on. Is his following, or you're basing that on his well, expertise as it, a comedian? It's, it's, it's the following because I am of the assumption always that if somebody can, this is not getting a Netflix deal. Somebody does a, a Netflix show, I don't know if they're funny or not, because who the fuck knows why they got that. But if you can, on your own, uh, in your own interface with the meritocracy out there on YouTube, develop a huge following for your stand up comedy, it's very likely you're pretty good. Now, I'm not talking about TikTok videos. There's, there's, there's caveats to that. But if you're actually putting half an hour, half hour specials out there and you're getting a million people to watch it, 
chances are, I can't be sure, chances are you got something going, you know, because there was no gatekeeper who put money behind you. Whatever. This is people telling other people, you got to watch this guy. He's funny. So that's, I, I just put faith in that, you know. Is that, is that crazy? Uh, I mean, I don't know. That's It's your club. You got a right to have whatever process you want to have on how to book it. I would say, to me, if it was just my opinion, I would think it would be like, I think the whoever the top comedians are, like the OG comedians, like I don't, I'm not talking about who's like selling the most tickets on the road right now. I mean like the David Tells here. It should be like they all get to vote. They they decide who the next guys who are passed at the club right, are. To me, right. that would be the best. No, I thought you were a libertarian. This, I, this is private well, property. Well, I, I started by <laughs> I started by saying it's your club. You have okay. a right to do That's, what you so, want. So I, I have, now listen. I didn't know that much about you until a few days ago, except that you know, and I started like do, I, I started doing like a deep dive on Dave Smith, mm -hmm. and I was surprised that there are a lot of things that I really don't agree with you on because I always figured I would because you're libertarian. I, I have libertarian tendencies. You're anti. Can, can we define exactly what libertarian is? Because I've never been a hundred percent on that. Well, <laughs> I would if if I were to define it, I would say libertarianism is the belief in self ownership, uh, private property rights, and the non aggression principle, and that everything else is kind of extrapolated from there. But Generally speaking, uh, people who believe in very small government, free markets, non-intervention, yeah, non stuff even, like that. Yeah, like my, my general interface with it, I agree with all that, is that people should be free to do whatever the fuck they want to do as long as they're not hurting somebody. Like and, in, a, in a very, very— And, and to be more specific than hurting, because hurting could be like dumping someone. Encro could encroaching hurt, on Encroaching on their, their rights. So, would, would you agree with— wait, Hold on, Dan. So I was in the middle of something. Well, so okay, so no, I, um, I don't even remember what I was saying. What was I saying? You were saying you're in the middle of something. You were surprised that you disagree with me because you oh, consider yeah. yourself to because be I, pretty Because I find myself to be uh, have libertarian tendencies. And um, I really did lose my, my train of thought. But anyway, so, so but you, you go further than I do on, on certain things. And, in, and I'm going to play some stuff in, to, to react to. But in a, in a certain way, there's certain things which seem to me that I, that I think are not fun in games that you are much more casual about. Now, that may just be performer stuff. I don't know what it is. So, so the first thing that, that came to my attention was this guy, uh, Nick Fuentes. You have oh, him on your okay. show. Now, wait. Now, listen. I well, Okay. So but this, before we play, hold on. Before we play, I want to say this. I think you're absolutely right to have these guys on the show. I don't believe in the fact that you shouldn't platform people. I think you should have every fucking Nazi and KKK member in the world on the show. So I don't, that's why I am like, like I had Norman Finkelstein on the show and I got a lot of grief from very influential Jewish people like trying to like say, what the hell are you doing? You shouldn't be, and I'm like, fuck you. Do we believe, we, we've been complaining for five years about all these people like heckler's vetoes and people chasing people out of things because they don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. And now, we, was that just opportunistic? Like, yeah, I, I believe in this stuff. But what I don't agree with is that we should have these people on to normalize them and not challenge them. Because to me, and I, I don't think you're going to agree with me, Jews scream and, 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 and all oppressed people to some extent cry wolf about racism and bigotry and anti-Semitism nine times out of ten times. But there are real, there, there are real anti-Semites out there. Mm -hmm. There are real bigots out there. And they are dangerous. And they do soften the ground. And, we're, and we're, we're kind of seeing it now with the Israel thing, regardless of whether we're on the conflict. We saw it on October 8th, kind of like a, a softening around where people speaking very dehumanizing ways. So anyway, so play this little clip and, and, and um, you tell me what you think. Okay. It's not simply to say, well, I hate blacks and Jews and gays and all of that. I mean, I, I, I think the truth is that that might describe some people, but it really doesn't describe everybody. And I honestly don't think it describes Nick. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I really don't think it does. When a Christian talks, when a Christian quotes the Bible in America, you sit your ass down, Jew boy. This is America. This is a Christian country. This is in Israel where they tried to ban the gospel. You made your money here. But you're not home. And Neil Hitler talked about the same thing. It's that when you look at a, a truly open society, a truly liberal, international, open society, that tends to be where the Jewish diaspora feels the most comfortable. And so they have this sort of histrionic fear 
of nationalism or of white solidarity because they recognize that in, in any kind of country that's Christian nationalist or God forbid, if there's a white nation, God forbid. well, they're going to stick out like a sore thumb and be the aliens. So it sort of behooves them for a country to be as diverse and sort of Star Wars cantina as possible. You know, enough with the Jim Crow stuff. Who cares? Oh, they had to drink out of a different water fountain. Big fucking deal. Oh, no, they had to go to a different school. Their water fountain in that famous picture was worse. Who cares? Grow up. Drink out I of the fountain. We get the point. We get the point. Water, so so I don't, what's your feeling? About, do you, like, do, do, did you just misspeak or you actually don't think he hates blacks and Jews? Well, I, okay, okay, so if you go back to the first clip that was a few seconds there, uh, the only one I'm there. involved in, you yeah. might notice at the bottom of the screen... It says Nick Fuentes verse Dave Smith yeah. because this is a two-hour debate that we did. Right. And the final, my closing statement of it was to kind of employ Nick and his young audience to reject racialism and all of this kind of collectivist nonsense because it leads to really stupid places. Now, But do you what, think he's an anti-Semite? I don't know. I okay. don't really well, know. So, that, so what, what, what would you're doing indicate here, an anti-Semite? Well, listen, I, again— it's, I'm just saying I don't know. What you're doing here, right, okay. is you're splicing one little clip of me with the worst clips you could find of this guy who is, I think, 23 years old and is clearly doing some type of, like, right-wing shock jock thing. It's just like with all the Internet comments. It's kind of difficult to tell who here is genuinely hates Jewish people, who here is trolling and saying the most offensive thing they can think of, who here is, like... Some kid whose stepdad just beat the shit out of him and is like venting online. So I don't know. I don't, I think, I guess in that moment that you showed me, I was kind of like presuming the best of you, assuming you're yeah, not. Yeah, that's actually fine. That's this fine. Person. But I'm asking you now, do you, now that you've had more experience with I, I just gave you the answer. I don't know. And I haven't had more experience. I've heard you play 30 seconds of random clips well, completely, you, he, he completely went on, isolated. He went on on the Jews a lot on your show. And then I imagine you've heard him on other shows. He didn't, he didn't go. And on the Jews, a lot of my show. I, he didn't. In fact, we rare we didn't talk I, about ha, that. Have much. you have you heard him on other shows? I mean, I've the I've seen. I've never watched a full episode of anything he's done. I've seen okay. the the hits or whatever the hits that matter. get posted. Oh, sure, but also a lot of them are just kind of like it's a little bit difficult to tell. And with that whole Groiper movement, it's kind of they're uh, they're very young, very male, and they're very sarcastic, like like the Hitler and, youth. Well, the Hitler youth weren't very sarcastic. No, I, 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 I had the thought before you said sarcastic. But so, uh, <laughs> but so it's, How do you know? it is a little bit difficult to tell where the line is and what they really believe and what they're saying to be shocking. Regardless, I think for an adult who's not a 23-year-old um, looking at it, I look at them as a reactionary movement to kind of the, the woke world that they kind of are reacting against so i don't know um i don't know what, what he okay, feels about enough. different groups of people fair enough but what but this is what i know dan this is what this would bother me first of all, i think it's obvious i mean i'm can't read anybody's mind but he's either an an academy award level actor or that was real venom coming when he's a jew boy this is more than just trolling i can't like i said i can't read his mind but that was pretty fucking convincing as a as a six-year-old person who's read people pretty well in his life that didn't seem like trolling and i and i watched a lot of him um but isn't what he's doing dangerous yeah i mean there's i i suppose yeah i think i think almost anybody who is advocating any type of politics that are um, authoritarian, you could say, are dangerous, but there is a hierarchy of dangers, and usually that is determined by who actually has power to implement their their policies. So, for example... They don't get power without having grassroots support. Yeah, okay, but for example... Well, that's an if, important point. I, okay, but let me just say what I'm yeah. saying. If yeah. there's a homeless guy outside who would have killed... 10 million Jews if he was in charge of Nazi Germany. He's not a threat the way Adolf Hitler is because he actually was in charge. Uh, he did have power. I see Nick Fuentes and his supporters having zero political power in this country. There he had is lunch a lunch with Trump. 
Yeah, he had one. He had one dinner with Donald Trump where he was brought by Kanye West. Right, the but most, he's, he's in the, the most sort- famous guy. No, the most famous guy in America right. brought him there. To, or the two most. Can I put one more thing on your mind? And then he got kicked out when they fig- they figured out who can, he can was. I, yeah, fair enough. That, maybe I shouldn't. That, maybe that was a bad point. Can I can I ask you a question? Is it possible from his point of view and from what's the other guy you had on Richard Spencer, mm-hmm. who is not a kid and says basically yeah. the same stuff? I just cut out some of the Richard Spencer videos because I didn't want to make it so long. Respectfully, now is it possible that they see you as a useful idiot? Useful idiot meaning here's the Jew who will have us on, s- laugh with us, say that we're not anti-Semitic. He goes out there and everybody sees it. If it's okay with the Jews, it, you know, it's, it's, it's the precise kind of, it is actually a precise use of the term useful idiot when it's usually not used properly. Like behind your back, I could just imagine him saying, this fucking sucker Jew has me on the show and I get to say all this stuff and he doesn't even care. Uh, it's possible. Don't you worry that, about that? Uh, it's po- I worry about that. Well, it's possible that they say stuff like that behind my back, or I guess it's possible, um, as you said, that they're using me or some in some way like that. It's also possible that these guys, that maybe me being a little bit younger than you, and these guys being a little younger than me, say the Fu- the Fuentes fans, that maybe I have a little bit more insight into like what their mentality is than you do, and maybe it's possible, just possible. That their entire energy source is your outrage against them. And that as soon as you sit down with them and you kind of remove that from the table and you go, listen, I'm not outraged. I'm not like giving you this like, because that's where all their energy comes from, is that everybody's like, oh my God, we can't handle what they're saying. And then I just sit there and remove all of that and say, let's have a conversation. And I'll tell you, the truth is that I've gotten... I mean, I can't tell you how many messages from people who were like, I was going down the alt-right pipeline until I saw your interview with Richard Spencer, and then I kind of came back and saw that actually you were making some good points. And the thing that I did in the Richard Spencer interview, which literally was, I think, what exposed him the most, because I had never seen anyone do this before, and this is what I wanted to do, is I just had a a friendly conversation with him. I was like, I'm just going to treat you like a gentleman as long as you treat me like a gentleman. We talked about what ideas we agreed on, what ideas we didn't agree on, and then at one point I went to him, and I went, okay, so you want to create an ethnostate in the United States of America. This seems like a pretty far-fetched idea. How are you going to create that? What level of violence are you comfortable with using in order to drive all these non-white people out? What did he say? And he refused to answer. Yeah. He just refused to answer. And then a lot of people kind of said they saw that as being like an explosion. I, I think you're right for having these so guys on. So I don't know. You know, you could always say like, oh, is it possible that by having pleasant conversations with these guys, you're being duped, you're the useful idiot, and you're normalizing this now? I'd say that um, certainly when I had Richard Spencer on, he had a bigger following than I did. And Nick Fuentes, I don't know because he's been kicked off everything, but he's, I think, has a pretty big following. So it's not as if I'm like giving, I'm like amplifying these guys' message. I think, if anything, to some degree, I see these guys as being like radical dissidents of the current order. And I think it's correct to be a radical dissident of this order. They're doing it in all the wrong way. And I'd, I'd want them to come over to, to, you know, like my side, but not really them as much as their audience. By the way, he's, al- there, he's almost exactly in the middle of me and you. But go ahead. And, and, uh, I, and, I, and I'm not outraged, but go ahead. Well, just, uh, I mean, rela- in relation to, uh, you know, anti-Semitism and racism and so on. Yeah. Now, you say libertarianism is, is uh, the least government possible, or uh, I guess roughly what you said. Um, would that include... Uh, legislation against a private business deciding they want to be whites only would that be part of the libertarian philosophy well yeah technically that would it would be libertarian that you have the right to do that now it doesn't mean that it would be something that we think ought to be done or would support doing that but in the same sense if you if you truly believe in freedom in the same sense that you could say i'm not dating any black people or I'm not going to, you know what I mean? Like it, in many senses where you can legally discriminate still now is that you could have a no black people in this studio policy. Um, yeah. The fact that you have a store that faces a sidewalk to me shouldn't change that moral equation. I think Rand Paul got in trouble for saying the, the mm-hmm. same thing. Yeah. I think he walked it back after that because yeah. it was just, it's too politically difficult of an issue. But I would also just point out that like from the libertarian point of view, it's kind of like, Look, slavery was the law of the land in this country, and then segregation was the law of the land, and we could r- rattle down a whole long policies of where the the government itself 
it was was literally what created the worst of the conditions. And then once they repeal all of those, they also go, oh, and we're also going to make it illegal uh, for for you to to discriminate in your business. And now that's an excuse for us to start start hyper regulating all of these businesses. So the entity, the government, was clearly the most guilty in all of the history of like slavery and segregation and all of that. So just saying, you know, but I, I know that is kind of it's it's just funny because it's like we we live. The U.S. federal government is the biggest organization in the history of the world by any metric. We spend over six trillion dollars. Bigger than a the year. Chinese Chinese Communist Party. Sub, uh, substantially bigger, more powerful government. Now, I'm not saying they might do different things yeah, for their yeah. own people. Go ahead, go ahead. But when it, when it comes to like, oh, you believe in limited government, it's always like right to this one. Like, okay, but what about hanging whites only signs on? And I do understand where that's a concern. Um, but yes, I I would say that I think. The mechanisms of the free market would do a very good job to cleanse that problem. Can, uh, very can, I, can I answer you? Um, I don't. I don't. I understand where you're coming from. I there. I, I don't agree with you, but there are people who I respect who are not racists who do agree with you. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of that thing in Oppenheimer where they kind of like a late motif, late motif where they says. Uh, Theory will only get you so far. Remember that's in, in Oppenheimer? What's the quote? In, theory will only get you so uh -huh. far. Yeah, yeah, That it sounds good, but um, <clears throat> the consequences of it going wrong are horrible and not worth what we gain. Mm. That what we gain is that people who would like to discriminate against blacks and Jews have the freedom that theoretically we would like every human to have that freedom. But that's really, so, so they're going to have to have uh, blacks in their, in their restaurant or Jews or white people. Um, but to have a society where you have to check the rules of the place when you come with your black friends, um, or you can imagine where na right now you could just imagine Jews not being allowed or Muslims not being allowed in various restaurants. Second Avenue Deli doesn't want any power. Like this is just. Mm, I, think I, it'd be, I, I think it'd be very unlikely. I mean, look, you could say it, theory, it, uh, theory. Well, when you say unlikely, you mean a low amount well, of it, I've, but not zero amount. It would definitely Well, happen. I mean, look, there's never going to be a perfect And, and then what if, what, if a, what if a national well, chain, what if, what if Chick-fil-A says no gays? Right. Well, look, first off, I would say that the reason why, the, the reason why uh, Jim Crow laws actually forced private businesses to segregate, okay, because they actually had the op they had the opposite end of government intervention, right, is because, why? Why did they have a law for that? Because too many of the businesses weren't doing it. And so they had to, because if you could imagine, right, this is in the Jim Crow South, and black people at this time are largely living in poverty. And so the the restaurants but that they're going to you don't, aren't... You don't know these, that that's the reason. No, well, no, no, hold on. You don't know. But, no, 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 I do know this. So what, well, what am I saying that you're objecting to? You're saying that the reason that Jim Crow laws were instated is because too many people were not sufficiently segregating. And, no, I'm saying that the and reason I don't why think they, that's correct. No, I'm saying that at least part of the reason why they made it the law of the land that you had to not serve black people at this restaurant is because a lot of them were doing it. Because if you could imagine, these are cheap restaurants. They wanted the money. If someone's sitting there offering them money, they're like, eh, come here, have a sandwich, like whatever. Um, so I think all of the incentives of a free market would be pushing against exactly that type of stuff. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's a conclusion that no one ever would misbehave. That's still not the case even now with the biggest government. But also I would say, yeah, look, just to your general point of like there's theory, but it only takes you so far. And if this theory goes wrong, it can lead to disasters. I mean, yeah, that's true. But that's also true for lots of different um Theories like, say, neoconservatism, which has led to the deaths of millions of people over the last 20 years. That's true for, look, in the 20th I'm not century. Sure, I'm not sure what your point is. My, my point is that to pick out, you're arguing with a, this broad theory of libertarianism right over here in like what you think is the Achilles heel of the weakest well, I, point of it. No, rather than no, like, no, no. I, well, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm only, I'm only, he brought, I'm only talking no, about, I don't that. think it's the Achilles I'm, heel. I'm, I'm like, with you on most libertarian things. I'm saying on that one instance, okay, I, 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 think, I, I think that's fair. where, you know. Yeah, that, my question was not because I was trying to debunk libertarianism. My, my, my question was just because here's an area where maybe it doesn't work or maybe it does. Yeah, let's have a discussion about it. Um, not, well, not because I was trying to okay, let's throw move on, out we'll move on to other things because there's a lot of yeah, cover. But I'm, I'm with you. Like you know, I'm trying to build a business around the corner now, 
I, I've been joking on a while. Like I could get my son's dick cut off faster than I can pull out benches in, 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 in like the, the, yeah. law, the laws are, are crazy. Uh, and think about like what the, you know, if you're talking about that with your business that you're trying to build and think about what the ramifications are of that, that this is happening it with every single business, not just oh, in this city or this state, every, all around the every country. Every law. How, how much wealthier we would be as a society, how many more jobs there would be, how much more productive we would be. And then that maybe a lot of these other problems, a lot of these social problems we have, which do seem to kind of come about when there's times of scarcity. economic uncertainty. I mean, there's always scarcity, but when there's weaker economies. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah, maybe actually we would solve a lot more of these problems and we couldn't even imagine how harmonious it would be if we just let people, literally like you're trying to do, produce value for other people. Okay, let's get into Ukraine. Okay. Uh, I did. I clipped a little bit of your uh, 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 something you did on Rogan about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's unfair to you. I didn't do it to be unfair to you. I did it to like, just like give a capsule. Can you pl can you play that, Max? But if you if it is unfair to you, I'm not I'm not the type of person to clip things unfairly or try. Was it okay. Rogan or was it uh, Carlson? Uh, oh, maybe maybe I didn't maybe I didn't uh, maybe I didn't actually give it to you. All right, maybe I maybe I screwed up. There's nothing there about Ukraine. There's just the just the map, just the uh, the map of NATO and the. Oh, the what a schmuck! Nick Fuentes is right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Careful, you're normalizing him. Well, Nick, Nick okay. Fuentes never said Jews were dumb. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, so well, uh, you could just tell me what it was I said. Yeah, no, no. But, or, oh, or what I, you, you object I had to. a nice thing where you had each point. So, so, so your points are. All right, your first part was. Let's just start from the second part. You feel that. In many ways, the West provoked Putin into this action. And you, you construct it in the same way Roger Waters does. By, you, you do say, of course, Russia had no legal right to in, invade Ukraine, which almost feels to me like a disclaimer. I'm sure it's, it's something more than a disclaimer to you, but it's something you feel like you have to acknowledge that. But then you spend... If, if that's one minute, you'll spend, you know, the next 15 minutes talking about all the ways that this is our fault. Right. Um, well, I don't necessarily think it's our fault, but, uh, yeah, the D.C. and NATO, for sure. So, and you, you make a lot of this not one inch thing, which, in my opinion, you get that completely wrong. I research, I mean, completely wrong, but I'm going to let you say it because the inter interview was a year ago i think where you talk about ukraine so, it might have been so i want to allow for that. the fact that maybe you don't even have the same opinion exactly now but what is your no. opinion on the on our contribution to this thing in ukraine well i mean first off i think i get the one inch thing completely right but <laughs> regardless of that well, what is the one inch thing because so it's it's in um and and this is basically was kind of it was kind of almost like uh, reported by people who were there at the time. But now we can just go look. The, the documents have been declassified. And like, they're, they're, I mean, I don't have the links on me now. I didn't know we were going to talk about this. But that basically in 1990 and in 1991, so this was right after the Cold War ended and kind of during or right before the process of the Soviet Union collapsing, that there were these, uh, what what they call them, the two plus four uh, meetings. There's a series of yeah, meetings. This is, this is the first mistake. This was not after the Cold War ended. This was. Yeah, it was. No, this was this was 1990 when the Berlin well, Wall fell. Right. The Cold War ended in 89. No, the Soviet Union didn't dissolve until, until 91. Like, until like a year and a half after right. that. And at the time, the Berlin Wall Wall fell, and they were negotiating with Russia about what would happen with East Germany. Yes. So it was not a far gone conclusion. That the Soviet Union was on yes, its way that's, out. Well, that's right. No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I didn't say that though. I said it was after the Cold War, right before the Soviet Union ended up collapsing. Okay. So that. So yes, you're right. So the negotiations were about Germany and the reunification of Germany. The Cold War and, is still going on. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no go, end of Google, the Cold War. Google the end of the Cold there's, War. There's no official end of the Cold War, but so okay. long as the Soviet Union still, like, I would say that the end of the Cold War is when the Soviet Union uh, disbanded. It was. It, it actually may have ended when Germany reunified, but it was not known at that time. Uh, so when Baker was talking about what would happen with NATO and the, whether we would move east or not, he had no conception that no. there was going to be other countries. No, yes, because, yes, they absolutely did. And if you want to go look at it in the record, and I'll send you, Noam, the quotes when I get home. Hold on, Noam. I I'll send the you the quotes when I get home. Did the you read Sorot's book? 
uh, not one let, inch. let me just finish this, okay? I'll send you the quotes when I go home. Yeah, but I read the whole book Hold on, on. Yeah. just let me just finish what yeah, I'm saying. Please. Forget that reading the whole book on this. We have the minutes of the meeting. You can look at what exactly what I they said. I have the quote here. And they go, no, 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 you don't have the quote that I'm referring to, so okay. let me just finish what I'm saying. Go ahead. Where there's, it's not only that they say not one inch east uh, um, a few times, but then in the follow-up meeting, they go, look, we already promised them not one inch, uh, inch east, so that means Poland and the others are off limits. So they're clearly talking about not just you wanna, Germany. You want to look it up on the... I I, 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 I will tweet like this you, when I get home. I promise okay. you this is what was said. Okay. That they said, in, and so that clearly, they even said in their own interpretation, that clearly means Poland and the others. So what they were saying was, what the deal was. Can, can you find if, it? If, because they, because this, is, this is a problem when somebody, listen, I've read everything there is to, to, to on this subject. I read a whole book on it. I read Mearsheimer. I read uh, uh, every every major scholar on it. Okay. Oh, and so, I have not seen that. Okay. I will find it for you. But let me just say, it's very clear that what they, because first, by the way, the defense of this was that it never happened. Then it was, well, if it happened, it doesn't matter because it wasn't in a formal treaty. And then finally, I think even the New York Times acknowledged once these documents came out that they were like, well, yeah, it did happen, but whatever. You know, so what, what gets, happened? But was, that was with the Soviet Union, not the Russians. So what happened was, so, was that, that when they were discussing the reunification of Germany, Baker said to um, to Gorbachev, "Well, hypothetically, if if we didn't uh, if we didn't move if we if we didn't move our forces one inch to the to the east, mm -hmm. would this be a way that we, they they were to, talking about the reunification of Germany, yeah. right? So at the time." Western Germany was in NATO, and Eastern Germany was part of the Soviet bloc. So they're trying to negotiate a reunification for, for NATO. And one of the ways that they basically got, so you, if you actually read the words too, what's kind of interesting about it is that the, the, the West in general is kind of like flexing on Russian fears. So they keep kind of suggesting like, how about an independent Germany? How about that? Okay, but and that's because you, if you could understand, like that's kind of a scary so thought to the Russians. So what they finally compromised on was they go, okay, Russia will allow German reunification, and the promise of that, and they could even and they be, allowed one more inch. They, they could even be NATO members, but they allowed one more what inch. The, what do you mean? There was no, there was no uh, limitation that we couldn't move our forces into NATO. Couldn't that move was, our forces well, into East Germany. The, the not one inch actually was abandoned in actually that treaty. Well, listen, but that the well, and that, treaties but that supersede was, everything that comes before them. Well, okay, fine. So Fair they enough. said they wouldn't move forces one inch east of of, of the West Elk Germany. River. So literally the middle of Germany. But then they did, so and Russia signed off on it. Yeah, well, then, I don't disagree with that. Well, um, then, then, then what came before? But okay, let me read you. A few. No, but that's not uh, okay. Go ahead. So, uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Now there, there are other there, there to be to be honest. There's, uh, he's a little. Um, there's some other quotes of his that are not as on point, but could be taken to be uh, interpreted. But this was his full quote in an interview. On, they asked him about this specifically. He says, the topic of NATO expansion was not discussed at all, and it wasn't brought up in those years. I say this was full responsibility. Not a single European country raised the issue, not even after the Warsaw Pact ceased to exist in 1991. Western leaders didn't bring it up either. Another issue we brought up was discussed, making sure that NATO's military structures would not advance and that additional armed forces from the alliance would not be deployed in the territory of the then German, you know, East Germany and German unification. Baker's statement mentioned in your question was made in the context, in that context, Cole and Genscher talked about it. Everything that could have been and needed to be done to solidify the political obligation was done and fulfilled. The agreement on the final settlement of Germany said that no new material. So that's that's Gorbachev. Very uh, um, uh, definitive. Then there's this guy, Kozirev. Koz who is a Yeltsin minister, says the argument about NATO encirclement is just propaganda. NATO was very useful for Russian hardliners because it provides the great enemy. However, if NATO dissolved tomorrow, they would still claim the West is the enemy of Russia. Putin said, oh, wait, no, well, let me get to, to Baker. Baker says he admitted that he said it. He said he, uh, Condoleezza Rice warned him that he shouldn't use the word jurisdiction. He says, I got a little forward on my skis and immediately pulled back. But the bottom line is, this is Baker, that's a ridiculous argument. Um, it's true 
that in the initial stages of negotiations, I said, what if? And then Gorbachev himself supported a solution that extended the border that included the German Democratic Republic or East Germany within NATO. Since the Russians signed that treaty, he asked, how can they rely on something I said a month before or so? It just doesn't make sense. Okay, so here's, listen, I get your point there, and particularly the Gorby quote I've heard a lot. There's lots of other uh, quotes from Gorbachev. So here's another one, okay? Yeah. And this is li- just flies in the face of that one, right? So clearly he's on both sides, and I'll send you the link if you want. No, there is. There are, uh, there are the Gorbachev quotes. Let me say, Go ahead. Uh, the Americans promised that NATO would, wouldn't move beyond the boundaries of Germany after the Cold War. But now half of Central and Eastern Europe are members. So what happened to their promises? It shows they cannot be trusted. So Gorbachev— but, but, hold up, but Gorbachev may not be referring exactly to that Baker quote. Well, okay— but he's making the point that this was promised. Okay, so now he's so he's kind of contradicted himself in several <laughs> different areas. The fact is that you can look at what he said here or look at what he said there. But this is or my beef you with can you. read the minutes of the meeting, which we have. This so is, we know exactly Dave, what was said. This is my beef with you. Mm-hmm. This this is an interesting fucking issue. Whole books are written about it. Mm-hmm. The greatest scholars are like actually I think they, they come down against you. But you know, there's but there's a uh, I haven't seen one actually come out in, in your direction. But they they so I'll, they, but they take it seriously. But you present it as a far gone conclusion, and this is what what I object to because people you're very influential. Uh, what is what is a far gone conclusion? You don't present it as one of a number of facts in this ambiguous picture of both sides and perhaps provocations and perhaps pretexts. You know, every provocation can also be a pretext. You, you, you decree it as this is what happened. We promised this and then we broke our promise. But the issue of provocations is very complex because, I mean, I, I tried to write the timeline down here. So right at, so in, in 1994, they signed the Budapest Memorandum, mm-hmm. which, which Russia promised to honor Ukraine's borders. Now, in a, in a normal world order, that's that. Like, you can bring up whatever, uh, like, statute of frauds, you can bring it up whatever was said, whatever somebody said in, in a restaurant, over a drink, whatever. To, but at the point that you sign an agreement, everything's prior is superseded. You can't, otherwise, there's no such thing as treaties. If I can sign a treaty, a peace treaty or whatever it is, and then say, I'm invading you three years from now because I, I, I feel like I, you know, you, you didn't live up to something that you've, said to me before the treaty, I'm like, wait a second. That's not the way the world works. You have to bring that stuff in the treaty. But then, right at right after the Budapest Memorandum, Russia invaded Chechnya. Provocations. Now Poland and the Baltics, whoever, I don't remember, Estonia, Latvia, whatever, they're like, shit, Russia's on the march again. We'd like to join NATO. And Clinton was president at the time. Clinton was, you know, torn about it. Is Russia responsible for its provocations? Maybe if Russia hadn't done that shit, then then these countries wouldn't have been eager to get into NATO. And then and there's provocations back and forth. But what's interesting to me, you're a libertarian. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me if you agree with this. I don't put like you made the argument. What if somebody came, you know, on on our border? How would we react? Like, well, yeah, I get that. However. I regard dictators as thugs. I have no respect for dictatorships. Any country based on a dictatorship is a, is, is, a, is a cousin of slave states. They do whatever the fuck they want. Now they might be all right. Tomorrow they'll be horrible. A democracy is different. I'm, 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 I'm West, pro-Western enough to say I'm not going to put them on the same plane. If we are about trying to fight for the right of people— to not live under the yoke of dictators. I'm on that side. That's the side you should be on. Yes, as, as long as so as long as there are elections and they claim that the confrontation is about spreading democracy, then I should be on that side. No, let, let me say that's a good point. Let me finish my little more add to it, and then you can answer and you mm-hmm. include that. And you also bring up the fact that there's nuclear risks. Now, nuclear risks, of course, that's the worst thing that could happen is a nuclear war. But number one, if we, if we accede to uh, nuclear risk, then literally any country that has a nuclear bomb can start lopping off territory. So we have to, we have to, give, it to give, give them that much. We, that, the, the game theory on that is nuts. 
and then if, if you really believe that, you should be in favor of bombing Iran, that they should have a nuclear bomb because then Iran can start lopping off territory and we have to let them have it under the same logic that we have to let Ukraine have it, except that at least the Russians are reasonable and the Ukrainians are, are jihad. Also, the Russians, and, and, the Russians and, actually have nuclear weapons, and, and they have, no, so but, that would help. But I'm saying if we were to allow uh, Iran to get a nuclear weapon— We're five years away, I've been told. If, would you let them get a nuclear weapon or would you bomb them? I wouldn't bomb them. Okay, so if you allow them to get a nuclear weapon, then the second they go into another country, you'd have to say, well, we can't risk a nuclear war. Let's make, let, they, should, no said, they should settle. But, but that's not what I or anybody but that's, I've heard but, has said. But that's the consequence of this. But the thing is, what, it, nuclear weapons are very dangerous, but they're never going back in the bottle. The most dangerous thing is dictators with nuclear weapons. It's not democracies with nuclear weapons. Dictatorships. Well, I mean, that's an assertion. I, I don't know that it's actually backed up by any evidence. The Did only, you ever watch Chernobyl? Well, the only people who have ever used nuclear weapons aggressively were the Democrats. That is, United the, States that is of America. The, the most sophisticated so point ever said by anybody on planet Earth. No, well, you're, you know better than that. No, I don't. It's a it's a fact of history. So I don't know what exactly you think is sophist uh, about I'll, it. I'll, I'll but you're saying you're just asserting that the most dangerous thing is a dictator having nuclear weapons. Perhaps I would. I wish we could snap our fingers. Are dictatorships more likely to to to, to uh, cause uh, horrible wars than democracies? I don't know how you can even make that argument after the last 20 years of American foreign policy. In the last 20 years, America has fought wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Somalia, Yemen, Pakistan. I mean, so, and we're going to look here and go, oh, the worst thing is what a dictator could yes, do something like yes, this? Yes, So I, I don't think that's actually, I don't think that's self-evident. Um, I'm also against dictatorships. I just think you maybe are kind of brushing over some of the crimes that democratic governments... No, no, of course. No, I'm not also. brushing over the crime. But I'm it doesn't saying, seem... But look, anyway... Well, let me put it, I'll ask the question a different way. If every country in the world was democratic, mm -hmm. do you think that would be a more stable country, world than the world we have now? Quite, or, quite possibly. Um, possibly? But, or for sure? Well, well, no, because, you know, there's actually kind of a paradox there. So, like, most parts of the world probably would be a lot worse if they were democratic right now. So the question becomes in this hypothetical you're laying out of like, how exactly did we get to this point from that point? Because what did Egypt do when they had democracy briefly, right? Who did they vote for? The Muslim Brotherhood, right? Yes. Who did Gaza vote for in their democracy, uh, to, at least largely for, for Hamas? I'm defining democracy differently than you. I'm defining democracy. Why do, I, I think actually you would agree with my definition, but I think you're just not, we're not being clear now. Democracy is not just about elections. Democracy is about freedom, free press, free religion, all the things. Which, so, yes, if yeah. the world were free, that would be much better off. Yeah. We would be much better off if there was a lot more freedom in the world. Yes. But like, let me go back to your point, because I think you're mischaracterizing my position a little bit. Yeah. I'm not saying that Vladimir Putin's got nukes. Therefore, he gets to do whatever he wants to. And therefore, any you know, we must all just acquiesce to whatever he does because there could be a nuclear war if we don't. My position is more like, since he has nukes, let's not provoke a conflict with him at every chance we get to. Let's not put him in an impossible situation that we ourselves would never tolerate. And then let's not cut a blank check to fund a proxy war on his border and discourage peace negotiations in the process. If you didn't That's think, more my position. If you position. didn't think we had provoked him, you'd be in favor of us taking Ukraine's side, everything no. we're doing? No. So I the think provocation is not even the point. No, no, no. It's a it's a component of but the what, point. But let's but take you, let's take it out hypothetically. Okay, S your your position doesn't change. No, if, if anything, what the United States of America should have done is the exact opposite of what we've done, which has now been confirmed in lots of reporting that we were actively discouraging peace negotiations. And of course, this is another problem. That's not true either. Hmm. Okay, all right. Well, Fiona Hill had the initial reporting on it. There were just more documents that backed this up, I, that there, we there, were discouraging, that, the, that they had uh, come to the table and they were trying to work out a true. deal, yeah. and that the Americans were basically like, no, don't you take this deal. Or well, that Boris Johnson said it, basically, well, I, as I mean, a proxy. I read all about it. I, I, I listened to Bennett's whole interview, you know, the uh, Israeli, and um, but then Bennett tweeted out, that is, unsure there was any deal to be made. I give it roughly 50-50 chance. The Americans felt the chances were lay, way lower. And then he points out that the deal was going to have um, security assurances for Ukraine, which the Russians felt were actually not that different from Ukraine being in NATO. So that was a, that was, that was a, a reason that it would fall apart. And then, and then Russia took the deal off the table. Deals are hard. But the, uh, 
Well, even if you're saying it was 50-50, I mean, to discourage the 50% chance well, but, that but, tens of yeah, thousands but, more but people didn't have to quite die. An, it's quite a, like a colonialist attitude, but the Ukrainians don't want to lop off 20% of their country. or what, put, put up the map of uh, the, 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 that I had of, of the current Ukraine thing. Like now the, the, the things I was looking it up. You got it, Max? Yeah. Put up. So what everybody's encouraging Ukraine, can you, can you zoom in on it? What everybody's encouraging Ukraine to take now is to essentially um, give Russia everything that's pink there. And if you look at it, if, you don't have, if you're not watching on YouTube, it's basically the entire, Ru Ukraine almost becomes landlocked. It's about 20% of Ukraine's territory. You had said on Rogan that um, it was majority Russian. It's not majority Russian. It's 58% and 56% um, Ukrainian. Ethnic Russians are 39% and 38.2% of the, the various old blocks, whatever. It's not, it's not majority Russian. But um, even if it is majority Russian, the polls show they don't, right now, they don't want Well, yes. Okay, the polls now have, have changed. But, there, but anyway. Was, hold on. But there was polling to be clear but it before the thing started. But it doesn't no, matter. It, and I mean, because does. they signed a treaty well, recognizing okay. borders. They signed the treaty and 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 if that is listen, you want at some point you, you can't want, you can't just win borders in a war, right? Listen, Israel How's you that want, jive with your Israel. Well no, I was about to say the thing. If you want Israel to sign a two state solution, mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems Israel has had with that, and we're gonna go to Israel in a second, is that well what if Arafat gets assassinated? Then the next guy t takes over. A deal with a dictatorship is not the same thing as a deal with a with a thing. So we can't trust we can't trust this. If, if we, if the world signs off on the fact that a provoked Russia, because something that was said thirty years ago, no, now, no, no, but that's not. But you're totally like this. This is just ridiculous now because you're totally just like skipping over my entire point. No one's saying Russia is provoked because a thing was said thirty years ago. You don't There's, even need the. Let me take it back because yeah. you said the provocation doesn't matter. If Russia, no, I didn't say that either. I that's asked the, you if your position would change if Russia. Wasn't yeah, but that's provoked. a different thing than saying it doesn't matter. That it did happen in reality and it does no, very much. But I'm matter. saying if we, if you, if your position would still be the same. That Russia could change its mind. That's what change its mind in a treaty and say, you know what? I want this twenty percent of Ukraine now. And the world says, well, this is the risk of a nuclear war, so we better. You should give it to them. But we want. We're going to be on our own here. We're not even going to have any. That's, none of that is my position. And so then if they, you want to, well, what's, you wanna, what's if, like if you want to ask me what my position what, is, I can tell. What them, am I that saying? That's wrong. Well, I, no, I'm not just saying that if Russia signed a treaty and then changed their mind, they should have that. That's not at all what I'm saying. In fact, as I've said many times, I think the Ukrainians have a right to fight for it. And I'm, that, that is their right. It is their choice. Whether Now, they're not really getting to exercise that choice because, of course, their army is conscripted and they're, fo they're forced to fight. Um, as, but As opposed to the Russians. No, they're conscripted too. Again, this, yeah. it's, it's, it's not catching me in hypocrisy. I wasn't claiming the Russian uh, force was voluntary. I'm just saying that, yes, they should have a right to choose to, if they want to, to fight for their land. I'm not uh, saying that at all. The point is that it's not just that Vladimir Putin signed this treaty in 94 and then changed his mind, that there were a large series of events and that the wisest people within our own government were warning the whole way through that this is going to lead to disaster here. Go, go. That's a different point. Well, I, I agree with no, no, you. No, no, okay. So, but, I'm, but then the story isn't, oh, Vladimir Putin signed something and then changed his mind. It's more like Vladimir Putin signed something, then we took this series of steps that- What steps? What steps? Well, okay. First of all, I mean, if you do, if you haven't ever read, um, by the way, you only brought up the I not mean, one inch. That's why I brought. I don't know this other stuff you're going to say. You didn't say it on the, in the interview. That's I'm not, I didn't. I, did, I said out. all of this okay, in, in sorry, the interview. Um, so anyway, if you ever if you haven't read it already, I would highly recommend anybody here go read uh, the uh, Burns, who's current CIA director. Uh, and he wrote this private cable to Condoleezza Rice in 2008. This is when she was Secretary of State in the George W. Bush administration's last year. And this is a private cable. This was not put out for any of us to see. We only have it because Julian Assange dumped it in a WikiLeaks dump. But so this is what they were saying to each other, the current CIA director talking to uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice. And he said the title of the document is Nyet Means Nyet. And the whole conversation was over Ukrainian entry to NATO. And what Burns says to her is that he's like, look, he at the time was the ambassador to Russia. And he's like, look, I've been here in Russia. I've talked to everyone from Putin's right wing critics to his sharpest liberal critics to everybody in his government. And it is a it is unanimous to a man that that Ukraine being admitted to NATO is the brightest of all red lines for him. And that was his term, the brightest of all red lines. And meaning not like when Obama talks about a red line, but like this really we is a red line. Well, hold on. Let me just let me just finish. NATO. Hold on. Let me just finish. 
Okay, so that's what he sends back to them, right? So he says to them that this is it, and he goes, not only is it totally unanimous in Russia, but if we move toward this, if we are we are going to engender serious risks of a civil war in Russia, or possibly even worse, Vladimir Putin intervening into Ukraine, a choice, in his words, that the Russians do not want to have to make. So two months after this uh, document is sent, there was the uh, Bucharest summit, where they announced Ukraine will be joining NATO. Now, they didn't set a date on that. George W. Bush pushed it through despite the concerns of uh, Merkel, who slowed it down so they didn't get a date, but they did announce that Ukraine was coming in. And why did the Germans oppose this? Because they knew this would provoke Putin did into doing something. Did you see Obama before? Huh? Did, I, I'm, I, I'll go back to this. I, I, I lost the, 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 I'm sorry, it's my fault. I lost the, the train. I thought you, you were talking about the Bush administration. This is still the Bush administration. Okay, okay? so this is all, the Bucharest summit, this is in 2008. It's the last okay. year of the George W. Bush administration. Okay. Okay, so that's, the, so then we announced it. And then we took more and more steps over the years, especially after the Yanukovych government was overthrown with U.S. backing. Okay, so. No, that, no, you, you don't know that. Yeah. It's another, it's another conspiracy theory. I, I. I, I, it's not a conspiracy theory, man. Uh, but anyway, let what me, is your we evidence? Can, we can go to, we what can is your go, evidence on that? What is the evidence of what? That there was a that we that we engineered a coup in. in oh, I didn't say we engineered a coup, but we certainly have backed it. I said we certainly backed it. Um, and there's pretty much. No, I mean, no, no. You, you had said elsewhere. I, I think that you, that we had that we had that we had engineered it or something. Well, I mean, technically, if you want to get into it, the kind of NGOs, they take credit for kind of engineering it. Um, if you want to look at that as an extension of the U.S. government, is a George Soros-funded NGO the same as the government? I mean, okay, he's just okay. the Democrats' biggest contributor, and then he also runs these NGOs. They brag that they got the protest. What out. was the catalyst well, to the I mean, protest? No, it's like the, the, the issue here is that it's like— Go ahead. So, anyway, but after after this, this coup happens, you know, this totally organic— a revolution of the people, where, by the way, for some reason, John McCain and other senators are right there, and we got, uh, um, you know, what's her name? Uh, Newland. Uh, Victoria Newland in the streets handing out cookies. But it's a totally organic protest with no Western, uh, you know, influence at all. But after that, NATO started doing joint training exercises with the Ukrainian army. I mean, just the type of things that if you could imagine, like, if Russia were doing joint military training you know, exercises with Mexico, what DC would do about that. And then uh, that once again, right before the wo war broke out, um, Kamala Harris went over there and said, the plan is still Ukraine coming into NATO. That's still the plan. And that, like, listen, my, my position basically is that it's totally unreasonable for Vladimir Putin to have invaded the country and killed all these innocent people. They have every right to defend themselves against that. But it is totally reasonable for him to have said it is unacceptable that your military alliance is in my biggest, like, neighboring state right no, here on that's my border. So, 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 so let me just say, because I, I don't think I made it clear. I'm actually quite sympathetic to, to the your argument, which I would uh, analogize to a terrible lack of defensive driving on the part of the United States of America. That, that we were, you know, poking a hornet's nest. Yeah. George Kennan uh, warned about it. We're leading Ukraine. I, I, I am not of the position of what you're well, saying. Well, that's a Mearsheimer quote, not a George Kennan, uh, leading him down the primrose was, path. Was, was, that was Mearsheimer. Mearsheimer. Yeah. Kennan says something similar. Well, so, yes, so, yes. So um, I am not, um, I don't buy the argument totally, but I, I've, I'm, I've, I've been torn about it because there's definitely, there's definitely truth to the fact that when you make policy, you have to be predict. This is the real. You have to predict what the consequences of that policy will be. It's clear that the consequences of this policy, we were well aware, was a risk that Russia might invade Ukraine. So if we're going to take that risk, that has to be a smartly considered risk. So that and if it wasn't smartly considered, then then that was a stupid thing for the United States. Of but America it's all. To do. But it, look, and you find this all over the place, right? But, but I want to add one but, thing. That wait, wait. Okay. But right on the eve of the invasion of Ukraine, the smartest people were saying Russia was not going to invade. The the in in retrospect, people were saying, oh, it was a provocation. They they. But at the time, even people I know who are, who know a lot about Russia are tied up with influential people there. Did not think he was going to invade, meaning they didn't feel that the current climate, you're going back 10 years, George W. Bush, but that the, the current climate uh, was such that they had a reason to feel this way. But again, there is something about this which is, for a libertarian, 
this is just the, the, what I find interesting, that, okay, now the Ukrainians have gone to war. They may end up having to lop off some of their territory. They're going to. But it might still be a victory for them because Kissinger was, was, had very much your point of view for a long time before he died. He felt that in the peace that now Ukraine should join NATO. For very different reasons, uh, he, different, he may have agreed with but, some of but that. But because one of the assumptions that underlay, underlied, I don't know what the word is, all the things that we're saying is that everybody assumed that it was going to take two or three days for Russia to go right through Ukraine. A few weeks, something like that, yeah. yeah. And that was also part of the calculation here. The people who say, don't provoke Ukraine, they, they were all saying, what are you going to do to them? They're, they're, going to be, they're, they're going to be demolished by Ukraine. They're going to be decimated. Didn't turn out that way. They may give up some territory, and they may buy themselves an independent future. And they may look at this and say, you know what? We, we, it wasn't 100% victory. We, 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 didn't, we didn't demolish Russia, but we're way better off than we would have been without this war. A thousand years from now, they may celebrate this war as the turning point in their history. And if that's the case, as a libertarian, you should be, you know what, fuck it, good for the Ukrainians. Well, I, I mean, I don't know, Noam, that's like saying if in a hundred years Iraq has figured out how to be this wonderful, successful country, then we'll look back and say it's a good thing George W. Bush invaded because they never would have done this if Saddam Hussein got out of the way. I mean, I, I suppose I can't argue with your possibility of what the future could hold. I will say that it seems like by taking all of these provocative steps and then uh, giving a blank check to fund this war, it's extended the war, created the war, and extended the war, and okay. I think hundreds of thousands of but people But do you understand, died. do you agree that it's not fair to say only one side takes provocative steps? Uh, but I never said that. Right, right. it's only a talk. Russia but who was, said that? Russia was on the march, too. Russia made Russia made the former Eastern, uh, the former Soviet nations, Eastern Bloc nations, very, very insecure. They were urging us to take them into NATO because they felt that as soon as Russia got back on both feet, it was going to take them yet again yeah, in why one would, way or another. Okay, but again, it's not like – it's. I'm not making a binary statement. I'm kind of uh, talking about things that I think are important. So I'm not making this statement that Russia is good or Russia hasn't done anything they shouldn't have done. Um, and I could certainly understand why small Eastern European states – would want the biggest, most powerful government in the world to guarantee their security. Isn't it good for that stability? Well, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's working out that well. No, I mean, I don't think so. I think that uh, basically NATO, the at least if you had listened to the propaganda yeah. for the 50 years, uh, the first 50 years that NATO was created, you would have uh, thought that if the Soviet Union collapsed and we made peace with Russia, the NATO no, would be disbanded. I just want to say it. that it's six. I don't know how much time... Dave is willing to give us, and if you want to get into Israel. Okay. You want to, so, I mean, I don't know how much time. I thought we were going to talk about comedy beefs here. <laughs> no, no. So I want to talk about stuff you talk about on your shows. So, and and listen, and again, and, and everything you're saying, I hope you will apply to the Arab-Israeli conflict because there are provocations. I think I'm applying the same no. principle. So, so for yeah. instance, we think Russia, Ukraine should give up all that stuff on the, on the map there, 20%, but then the same people will say, the Palestinians had a right to, to to say no to that deal in 2001 because there was, you know, there was four percent that they they uh, of the traditional West Bank that they they had a right to hold out for. Talk about creating world instability. Well, Talk I'm about, not saying that. Yeah. Um, I think that's what the pro-Israeli side says, not what the other side is saying. Um, that it was only four percent is what the holdouts were over. Um, but no, I mean, I think I'm generally applying the same principle to both. I mean, it's. To say that he wants to talk about your Begin tweet, I don't. I, I want. I, I what tweet? I suggested that as a as a possible talking point, as well as the vaccine and the one and the single bullet theory. So he he tweeted. <laughs> there's a lot of conspiracy. Do, does it bother you? Like a lot of the people that you are fellow travelers with, Tucker Carlson says that uh, that we, we we actually have alien beings and we're studying them and their weapon systems at the Pentagon. Yeah, I don't buy that. Roger Waters says that the, the October 7th was likely a false flag. I don't buy that either. Uh, uh, um, Brett Weinstein says that there were explosives on every floor of the of the World Trade Center and that's how we, they staged 9-11. Uh, Not familiar uh, with that. Right, but... but uh, oh, yeah, I can show you that. The, um, the point being that 
the standards of proof, and then Tucker Carlson will say that, you know, uh, we knew about Pearl Harbor and William F. Buckley's in the CIA. The standards of proof that these uh, guys— there's, there's some evidence on the Pearl Harbor one. Did, well, I actually, I contacted a Japanese historian. Today, but anyway, the, the point is that the standard of proof of these guys, if, if your standard of proof is so rickety that you're ready to state as fact— can you play that little Tucker Carlson thing, that first thing, the right thing? The U.S. government has physical evidence of crashed non-human made aircraft, as well as the bodies of the pilots who flew those aircraft. The Pentagon has spent decades studying these otherworldly remains in order to build more technologically advanced weapon systems. Okay, that's what the former intel officer revealed, and it was clear he was telling the truth. In other words, UFOs are actually real, and apparently so is extraterrestrial life. Now we know. In a normal country, this news would qualify as a bombshell, the story of the millennium. But in our country, it doesn't. Yeah. So to me, it's like, he's batshit crazy. Like, I would, uh, I would not take anything that man says about anything. Uh, okay. Is I that mean, not batshit crazy? I don't, honestly, I mean, I don't really know enough about it. I don't know who his source is or who he's making this claim. I, I would say he went a little bit far when he said it's clear he's telling the truth. I don't know why he thinks that's clear, but he's telling you, I don't know, some whistleblower. So I think that whole thing's a psyop, personally. I don't think any of it's real. I just don't buy. I'm just like, wait, so we all got like super HD uh, cameras on us, and yet the only evidence of this is always the Pentagon being like, "Look, we have this grainy footage, and uh, it's real." And I don't, I just, I just don't buy it. So I think that now, what's an interesting story, even in that world, in my worldview, is that it's like the Pentagon does seem hell bent on trying to convince us that this is real, and I don't exactly know why that is. It's probably some type of scheme for more power, bigger budgets, or something like that. But so I don't buy into it. <laughs> but no, sense. Tucker Carlson. I mean, look, you have to like. He's you nuts. Know, well, I disagree, but you you can focus in on these one like kind of specifics, and like I said, I don't I don't agree with that. I'd I'd be interested to know why he is so sure this guy's telling the truth. But I would say if you're going to talk about conspiracies and things like this over say the last four years, Tucker Carlson compared to almost everyone else in cable news has been less conspiratorial, more on point. He was better through the whole Russiagate thing where everyone just lost their freaking minds and became these wild conspiracy theorists, which all turned out to be nothing. He was kind of dead on that. And through the whole COVID thing, he was pretty solid about pushing back against some of the more insane tyrannical policies. So, But he was also conspiratorial in COVID. He was also, because this, you know... He turned out to be right about the conspiracy uh, in COVID. He turned out to be right about something. <laughs> yeah, about big portions of it, at least. Well, let me, let me put it this way. I was very uh, COVID independent. Okay. It sounds like I'm, I'm a big helping myself, but it's true. The things that they got right, I also felt that way all along. There was no need to buy into these conspiracies to know that there was a lot of obvious bull. You didn't need to buy into conspiracies to know that the fact that they were calling it racist to discuss a, a lab leak from China was was was. Uh, fascist. You didn't need to know that it was obvious that the vaccines had um, not been as effective as they said. You didn't need to know that it was pretty obvious that that, that they, uh, you didn't be a conspir conspiracy theorist to know that it was pretty obvious that they really kind of put the vaccine off until after Trump lost the election. They were uh, that the mask stuff was bullshit. There's all sorts of stuff that. Oh that yeah, was I mean, we, you could go on for ten hours on this, but that the fact that they were like uh, literally arresting kids on beaches and then demonizing anyone who but walked down the street he, without a mask, and then as soon as the Black Lives Matter protest happened, they were like, "Oh, the right. scientists say right. that racism is a greater threat than COVID." Dude, you, you, that was just insane. You and I agree on this 100. percent However, then Tucker Carlson will bring some woman on in a wheelchair, you know. <laughs> you know, all contorted and say, because of the vaccine. And he has no basis whatsoever for that. And then he'll, he'll deny, you know, there's clear evidence the vaccines work. There's also clear evidence that, that uh, able-bodied people didn't need to take it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little, uh, I mean, uh, and, and, but, it's and a little the, murky with the clear evidence that the vaccines worked. Uh, well, I would say, I, I don't know how clear that this, evidence but, is. But this is why, this is exactly my point. I mean, you can do your own research. I'm, I, I'm not Don't against, offend Dan here. I'm not against Dan doing your own research. Dan doesn't like doing your own research. <laughs> but there's people. But Tucker. But when I hear Tucker Carlson say this stuff about UFOs, what that says to me more than anything is, I, I'm not going to take my data analysis from Tucker Carlson. Nate Silver, who is also uh, pretty vaccine independent, 
has done deep dives on this. And he's written about it, and he's shown the says, and he's shown the, the graphs and in, in a very professional way, and he's, he's not a flake. And he's, and he's convinced me, and I, I, and I think it would convince any reasonable person, that for, as the risk of dying from COVID went up, the vaccine had a big impact on, on sparing these lives. In red states where the vac- there wasn't a lot of vac- much less vac- vaccine uptake, right after the vaccine, their rates of death shot up. While the blue states' rates of death sh- went yeah, down. Yeah, but there's so many other factors in that. I mean, look, COVID tended to tear through the cities first and he, then kind of make their way the out to more rural That's, points. It's just, you think it's Tucker very, Carlson is Dan Zambas with, with that? No, chair. well, look, I'm just saying that, look, a lot of these things, right, yeah. at, like stuff like that and stuff with just, say, like vaccine injury and stuff is very hard to Two actually different figure out. Yes, but I'm just saying that they have a similar problem where there's just— there's so many factors going into it that it's very hard to extrapolate from that that like well this was the cause and this was the result so like like i know people who um so i know this one uh girl who's pretty young and in perfect uh, woman i should say who's pretty young and, and in very good health um it's who got woke. who got double vaxxed and then boosted and then developed a heart condition uh after it now i do like that's how it happens most of the time and you're left going like I don't know. I mean, was it a result of that or was it not a result of that? Now, she also had COVID twice, but it seems to me that it was either COVID or the vax seems to be the most likely. Th- there culprit, is myocarditis. But you just don't know. You just don't myocarditis know. Myocarditis, asso- from memory now, there's myocarditis associated with the vaccines, the, the, the mRNA vaccine. There's, there's myocarditis associated with COVID. Yeah, yeah. And this wasn't myocarditis. It was just another heart issue. But, heart it's just, issue. Yeah. but it's just like, you are kind of left wondering. Now, the same thing and when you and see- is, And there's reactions to every vaccine. People, the question is a frequency. Right. And so, but people like with that example you used, I saw a lot of people who were trying to extrapolate from this because the, at first- the, the death rate in the blue states was higher, and then the death rate in the red areas goes higher. But the issue with that is just that, like, there's lots of other factors involved in this, too. And the truth is that the death rate, right, in the initial wave of COVID, yeah. where, where, right here in New York City, was the epicenter, right? And all the cities were where they had the most— the day. Transmit- my But point. so then also you had the most natural immunity in those areas. So in the later waves, the idea that the death rate would be lower in these blue areas and higher in the red areas Absolutely. makes sense without the vaccine. Absolutely it does, and I thought of that— I agree with you. But at some point, unless you're actually going to take out a slide rule and crunch the numbers and, 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 and have the statistical expertise to do that, at some point, you're going to have to size up the credibility of the person who is doing that. And, the, and, and that's what I try to do. There's certain things I can do my own research on, certain things I know I can't. So when a guy like Nate Silver, who I followed him on COVID, and he's not one of these fire-breathing guys, and he's not all lockdowns, and he's actually against any, you know, he's, he's pretty reasonable on this. When he undertakes that deep dive, and I have to compare it against the guy who's talking about UFOs, I'm going to say that I'm going to go with the yeah, guy. but I mean, that's you're, you're cherry-picking one thing Tucker Carlson said and then giving the whole body it's, of work. It's, of I'm cherry-picking one thing, it's said, enough. But didn't he also say 90% chance Hillary Clinton was going to uh, was gonna win the election or something like there that? There was right? a 90% chance. <laughs> well, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> well, you I know, guess that, you can stick to that. No, I, no, I, I mean... I'm mean, i I'm just saying, <laughs> listen, you could... You, you know what a 90% you, chance means? It, well, it means you, one out of 10 times sure, it doesn't win. Sure, <laughs> but okay. But uh, it seems like those odds might have been a little inflated. Yes, probably. But I'm just saying, like, to cherry-pick one thing out of a guy and then kind of, like, dismiss everything else. There's a Oh, okay. B- bio right. weapons right. labs in uh, Ukraine with like he, he he's and, and he'll and quite often if you really watch him like I used to watch him he'll say something once and then he'll, it'll drop off. Well, okay, but he also if you want to take him I want to talk about bacon. You, you're not going to leave. Are you? Sure, sure, yeah. sure. No, 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 I'll stick around. I got okay, I got go skanks at 8 o'clock, ahead, but I don't ahead, really have ahead. anything to do till then. Um so uh the, if you take them in their totality, I would also argue that Tucker Carlson said a lot of the most interesting things, yes. a lot of the most important things that no other voice in the corporate media was really or very few other voices were really talking about things that really mattered. Um so I you know, you have to take people in their totality. Oh, pr- pl- play that clip of, of Dave and Tucker about the Gaza refugees. We'll talk about Tucker. I was going to skip it, but this is this is something. You seem to agree with this. I think this is a horrible point. Hey. It was a great interview you did with him, by the way. The Thank fourth you. thing I want is the ability to, to like have a conversation about it. For example, on the question of refugees, there are, what, two and a half million people living in Gaza, Obviously, a lot of people of Israel want them to leave. I get it. You know, whatever, that's their country. 
But their argument is these people are too dangerous to live next to us. Okay, that's their view. But then for people to argue that they should come here, wait, I thought you just told us they're too dangerous to live in the place they were born, so they have to come to the United States. What does that say about how you feel about the United States? It tells me that you consider this country, my country, my children's country, a trash bin into which to throw your shit when you're done with it. And I'm so offended by that attitude, I, I can't even process it. Like, it actually makes me red in the face mad. It's so disrespectful to my country that I can barely deal with it, and I, I have a lot of trouble speaking to people. Like, people can have their views about, you know, is it justified to kill thousands of civilians? Okay, I'm trying to stay out of it. But nobody can justify that argument that these people are too disgusting and immoral and dangerous to live next to Israel, but they should live in the United States. Fuck yeah. you if you're making that argument. And yeah, I mean- 100 percent. One of the things that was really amazing to me was to see when <laughs> Donald Trump- Sorry, I lost control. It makes me no, so mad. It's you're so, you're it's absolutely so right. My wife or something, it's so- All right, that's, that's you enough. You don't even like America uh, if uh, you're uh, making uh, that uh, That's enough. That point is actually offends me. Why is that? Because- I mean, there's, I'm pretty fucking pro-Israel. I don't have that feeling about the Palestinian people. I, when, I, Palestinian people are not a threat. They have a beef with Israel. Hamas has a beef with Israel. The Palestinian people have a beef with Israel. They don't, they're not a threat. I know tons of Palestinian people in, in America. They're not a threat to America. They're not disgusting. They're not, they're not garbage. Okay, but there I, are and, a lot. But then, so you're not making the argument, but he's not saying... Noam made this argument. But he's saying that they shouldn't, that he's he's angry that we would bring them here. No, the point he's making is that there, and this is factually true, is that there are lots of people who are simultaneously making the argument that these people are too radical to live next to us, that they are disgusting savages in all types of horrible language, and also are saying, and I mean, these are people in the top level of the Israeli government, and also that all other nations have to take their fair share of them in, including the United States of but America. But he's also saying we shouldn't bring them here. Yes. Right, so he, so he's he's endorsing that opinion no, of them. No, 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 he did not endorse that opinion of them. He's saying the fact, no, that's not what he said. Oh, it's very he clearly what he said. He said the fact that anyone out there, and lots of people do, could have both of these opinions together is th it lets you know what you think of the United States of America. So he thinks we should allow them in? No, but that doesn't necessarily yeah, I, follow. That's that, that but, just logic. No, I, 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 I'm on, on Dave's side on, the, on this particular question. He's simply saying that if you have those two views, you're showing contempt for America. He's not without taking a side in that argument. No, no. now, I, if you no, want, he, he doesn't. Said, he says, I want to have the right to talk about it. He says, I want to be able to say that how dare you want to bring these people over here when they're so horrible over there. No, 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 no. There. That's, he said, no. That's he listed off three things. It was very clear what he said. He listed off a few things that he was like, look, however you feel about this war is like, here's one thing. Number one, I want to have the right to talk about it. I want to have the right to think. And then he said, and, and also there are these people who have these two views simultaneously. And having these two views simultaneously basically indicates to me that you think my country is a trash can so and the, you don't care about this at all. So the question is, is it? Are there a substantial number of people who have these two views simultaneously? No, I, listen, I, which I, is unquestionably true. I, I mean, like that I, I understand what you're saying. It makes sense what you're saying, but the problem is he's also endorsing the idea that he doesn't want them here. Well, he he doesn't exactly say that in this clip. I, I, mean, I, I didn't get that. I would also. I and would. Anybody I would, who listens to him knows. Well, he, yes, but that's but that's a totally separate. And he's issue. called immigrants dirty before. Well, okay. Regardless of that, because I'd have to have the context of that quote. Tucker Carlson has his own reasons why he thinks that we should have uh, more border security and less, you know, like uh, unfettered immigration coming into the country. His argument there would be that radical change is not good for a country. And when you radically change a country by bringing millions and millions of, of you know, uh, illegal immigrants into it, plus the million a year legally that come in, that this is, is destabilizing to a country. But he's— Now, what Israeli has ever said— that these people are discussing, we, and, and, and like they're fighting Hamas. They're fighting Hamas. You seriously haven't heard any rhetoric from people in Israel toward the Palestinians? That's I, been dehumanizing. I have heard some rhetoric, not a lot. M most rhetoric has been people trying to um, uh, limit it to Hamas. Most of the animal things, like by the by Galina, by by uh, uh, was it Weitzman, the president. The president, right afterwards, they asked him, do you mean all the Palestinians? He says, no, I mean Hamas. Yeah. I know that I saw those, I saw those videos. Like I had a screening of, of the, the, the atrocity videos. I understand exactly 
how the word animal comes to the mouth of someone who's, who sees these things. Is sure. It? Yeah. But I don't know people who, who are saying, I don't know Israelis say, I mean, you can find some you know, crazy right-wing settler awful person. There's, there's millions of people there. Oh yeah, I know. Well, there's people I've heard yeah. on um and say on all sides, like people at protests on both sides, just saying really horrible things yeah, about yeah. Uh, you know the other group. But I have a point about that too. But um, but the 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 mainstream opinion is not that the Palestinian people are disgusting, and if you would bring them to America, it's like we're a garbage can. That is a fucking mischaracterization of what any Israeli. As a matter of fact, typically Israelis get along with Arabs outside of Israel. Like they, they, you know, they, there's not, there's not, a, there's not, and inside of Israel, and inside of Israel, just not inside of the territories that they control. Right now, when when this has happened to the Israeli people, and and what's, it's not just what happened with rapture, with glee, mm -hmm. uh, chanting, cheering. There's a there's a um, natural question like, like what what the fuck do we, what what do we do? I mean any any nation would have that thing, but then to say that some refugees, not those people, the women and children, people displaced, should be brought to America, that that's saying take my garbage and bring it to that's that's a total. That's but just, he's saying if you, which I have heard people who have made this argument, and in fact, like people in high levels of the Israeli government have been saying, everyone's got to do their part in taking in some of these. But these the question is, 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 but they don't mean it. Take my take our garbage. I mean, like they, they're refugees. Well, they're saying because they're too dangerous to live next to us that other people need to take them in. So that he's just making well, the point say that, that, that if you. I don't oh. think I don't think that they're saying that the Palestinian civilians are too dangerous to I haven't heard that and I've been following I mean again I'm sure that there are some people saying awful things but I have not heard people referring to the Palestinian civilians in that way nor nor referring to America as like some so so yeah so early just early on in the thing the gray zone there was like October 9th or something there was some protest in Manhattan and there was this disgusting kid i think he was, he was a religious guy and he's wearing and he was carrying some sign like fuck you palestinian dogs it's like the most outrageous thing and i was so outraged by this that i went on twitter to try to find out cuz it's it's a pretty close knit community and i contacted some religious people to try to track down who this fucking disgrace to the jews was and I did track him down, and what I was told is he's mentally ill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I contacted the gray zone, and I said, "Listen, I know you have him on your, you know." And and AOC had had tweeted him out. I said, "You know, I, it turns out this guy is mentally ill." I didn't ask him to take it down, but you'd think. But it was interesting to me that the example they found was the mentally ill guy. Yeah, well, it's, it's not also that easy true. to find. Well, it's also uh, just in general in. And this is almost true for every like protest. Yeah, it's like no matter what issue, no matter how noble a thing you might be protesting against, it always just draws crazy people <laughs> to them. And then you always have a certain element that's crazy in your protest. Like if you had a, a protest against vaccine mandates, you're going to get like anti-vax kooks there who have all types of crazy views. If you have a protest against the war in Iraq, you're going to get people who hate America there because that, you know what I mean? So like, I don't think it's fair to draw any sweeping conclusions what any one person says at, at any one protest. Um, but that, that being said, I don't think, um, Anyway, I don't. I didn't take Tucker's point the way. Uh, the way you, you might be right. I'm going to go back and listen to it in context, but that's that's the way I took it. Maybe it's because I know. So I, much I'd say I think what he's talking about too is that there is this this broader tendency from the neoconservatives and neoconservative sympathizers who have largely been in control of Republican establishment politics for for most of the 21st century mm -hmm. and part of the late 20th century that do seem to have this view that. Um, let's say using anti-Islamic um, rhetoric in order to sell a war is totally acceptable, yet they get really upset when people use anti-Islamic rhetoric 
to propose like border security. So it was really interesting to me, and this is one of the things I mentioned to Tucker in the interview, where when Donald Trump proposed uh, that we cut off Muslim immigration, you know, when he was just a from, candidate. From, from nine countries or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but even before he put that proposal in, it was just something he said in a, in a stump speech when he was campaigning. Like we're, we're yeah, you're right. calling you're for that. a pause on all Islam I immigration to the United States. And um, watching all of these neocons and, and all these right wing radio show guys who had for years just been demonizing radical Islam, jihad, all of this. Obama won't say radical Islam enough. All of a sudden they turned around and were like, this is so offensive. <laughs> and it does seem like there was this- But neo I understand that. Well, okay, but it do I'm just saying there does seem like there were a lot of neoconservatives who were kind of for like America, like war everywhere and very easy borders here in America. But, but is there and a distinction that was made between radical Islam and the average Muslim, peace-loving Muslim at, person. At times, um, although a lot of those average peace-loving Muslim people were the you know casualties in these wars, but it was also there was also definitely a lot of just anti-Islam rhetoric that was trafficked in during the George W. Bush days and in the Barack Obama days that the kind of neocon right wingers were very happy to use and embrace um, until it came to being proposed for restricting border. Uh, Look, so anyway, the, 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 that's that issue is a thicket because there's a lot of Muslims in the world, yeah. and and a, I don't know what the percentage of them who believe this, these radical, crazy, violent stuff, but in absolute numbers, it's a big number. It's a critical mass number enough to upend every country. Most of the, until Ukraine, most of the horrible wars in the world in the last 10, 15, 20 years have been Muslim on Muslim tribal violence. Sam Harris said it was like 50,000 Muslim on Muslim terrorist attacks over the last 20 years. Some some crazy statistic. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I'd, I'd have to look at what exactly his stats are on well, that, but I don't know how much of that let's say there's five, Western involvement in. Like, let's say it's 5,000. No. But, but how many of those uh, Muslim on Muslim terrorist groups were like, you know, like in Syria where they had, I don't know if no, you remember no. the article where it was like the, the boys that the CIA backed against the boys that the Pentagon okay, We know backing. that just between Fatah and, and Hamas. Mm-hmm. There's torture. There's hanging. Each oh, other. sure. Yeah, 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 this, yeah of course. This is, unfortunately, a part of the, within that world. Listen, take one of the stories from Israel. The, the the volunteers who were going to Gaza to take these people to the hospital, right? The, the, they they actually came and killed those volunteers. You say, well, you think how can so in some way this ideology is profound, and you can't vet people easily for their ideology. And we've had so so, you know. I think we were all surprised after 9/11 that we didn't have more terrorism. I was always I was sure someone was going to blow something up in the subway. Like how could you stop that, right? Somehow we didn't have that. Thank God. But I think that every decent person, like the Syrian refugees, wants to bring these poor people over. I was upset with Obama that he was bringing not enough Syrian refugees at the time, and then. Somebody say, but you know what? How do you vet out the? T I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's tough. It's a it's a very tough uh, question, particularly when it's a part of the world that we've been at war with so much, and that I think most Americans would acknowledge. We have a whole bunch of whoopsies over the last twenty years where we, we fought wars that we probably shouldn't have fought and killed a whole lot of innocent Iraq people. Iraq, you're talking about? Oh, I'd say Iraq, not, not Afghanistan. Oh, absolutely. Well, we had no choice. What were we going to do? Oh, we absolutely had a choice in Afghanistan. I mean, look, there. You might say that, like, say the special ops missions in late two thousand one, that we we didn't have any choice. We had to go take out the. Uh, but the idea that we had to fight a twenty year regime change war against the Taliban. We didn't Taliban. fight for twenty years. We were there for twenty years. We weren't fighting for twenty years. Oh, but oh. listen, the, the idea that but we here's had the libertarian to do a regime thing again. change war against the Taliban. Well, this was is what, absolutely a this choice. is where they went wrong, and the reason they went wrong is not something easy to talk about. They believed there was historical precedent for this. Japan was crazy. Now Japan's our close ally and free. Germany was crazy. Now Germany's a close ally and free. Why can't we do that in Iraq? Why can't we do that in Afghanistan? This, this turned out to be the fundamental hubris and, and mistake, right? The reasons are probably cultural. And they're very difficult to talk about, right? But the the intention, of course, getting back to nuclear weapons and, I mean... Well, it also, look, in those two instances where it worked, you know, quote-unquote, in uh, in Germany and Japan, it was also what 
like a big step there was like ruthlessly slaughtering civilians in ungodly numbers, in numbers that nobody would be comfortable today doing. But the idea, and the idea so that, of, that's the idea a component of, as well. Yes, yes, yes. But the, so that they should have thought of that. But the idea of changing <laughs> minds, look, getting back to it, this is interesting. Nuclear technology is, you know, uh, 80 years old or something like that. Mm -hmm. 200 years from now, every country on earth is going to have weapons of mass destruction. The technology existed in the 40s. So, and this is what their thinking was. I don't actually even believe it was about WMD. So how is the world not going to blow itself up? The world is going to need to have free and stable democracies because, because dictators having these weapons will eventually be the end of us. It's not just because they're dictators and they're horrible. It's also, if you watch Chernobyl, because the very nature of dictatorships is that everybody says what the dictator wants. Nobody blows the whistle. Nobody wants to get in trouble. In Chernobyl, there were these crazy stories where they were measuring the amount of radiation and they were saying it's only 15 Rengen. It was actually like 1,500 Rengen, but, and 15 was just the limit of the, of the Geiger counter. Mm. But nobody wanted to be the guy to say, I'm sorry, sir, but it's actually 15. You know, this is, I, I'm sure in, in Iran... They probably have circuit breakers with duct tape on them, you know, like, like this is, you cannot trust uh, this kind of stuff to non-open societies that don't have a free press and whistleblowers and it's a system that respects whistleblowers and encourage, encourages whistleblowers. So the thinking was, what the fuck's going to happen in the, middle, in the Middle East 100 years from now? We need to try to reorganize it. It was a huge mistake. I, I don't think that's what the thinking actually was. That was the was. whole Wolfowitz doctrine. Yeah, but— Wolfowitz if, wasn't about WMD. It was about yes, reorganizing no, I, the I, Middle I East. I agree. Well, yes, it was about reorganizing the Middle East. But if you actually listen to these neocons in their own words, if you go read, uh, read a clean break, read the, the stuff from Project for a New American Century, basically what they were saying was that the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, that this was our time now to take over. And to ensure that American dominance would c continue through the 21st century. And in order to do that, here's what we wanted to do, was remake the Middle East in our image, not the old communist sock puppets. And we wanted to expand NATO as far as we could with their eyes on Ukraine, even back then at that well, time. I wish they had. And so, well, okay, maybe you do. But w when they did, when they saw You should too as a libertarian. No, I, I completely disagree. Don't but, you want to maximize liberty in the world? Yeah, not but not through military action. I <laughs> said, If you think that... Um, that uh, if you're saying Every, we, you, we your maximize, liberty depends on the, on the point of a gun in America, I'm not saying yeah. As long as it if it's a defensive gun, that's fine. But if you're talking about killing hundreds of thousands of innocent people to to in route to this project of then somehow you know it turns <laughs> out to be a freer, better society afterward, which by the way every time seems to backfire, then no, I would not support those. Your friend uh, Daryl Cooper means. corrected me. I said we killed 200,000 people in Iraq. And he said, no, they killed. He says, we killed far fewer in Iraq. The American forces, he said, did not but, kill. Uh, no, what yeah, but whatever. Yeah. We're still yeah. responsible no, for I just, it. Well, that, uh, yeah, yeah. Could I just press, you on, that, yeah. press you on that point yeah. uh, about, um, you know, remaking the world in our image? Yeah. Uh, how far should we go to remake the world in our image? Uh, uh, P, uh, 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 I, I Dave said, you know, at the cost of war, absolutely not. Listen, I don't know what our image is exactly. <laughs> yeah, really, we got to figure out our own image I, at this point. I, I know that... I believe that our ideals, even if we'd fall short on them, libertarian actually is is not a crazy way to describe our ideals. Well, it's the right. best. It's the yeah. best of America. I don't think we do a very good job living up to it in right. a lot of ways. But like, yeah, if you just look at like the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, it's yeah. like, yeah, that's kind of what we're supposed to be I, about. I, I, it's but, also it's well, also worth noting that every single one of the people who wrote and signed those documents. All very expressly uh, advocated against this type of foreign policy, okay. against entangling on alliances we're and looking empire for monsters building. to destroy. Yes, yeah. So we'll lose our soul, and yeah. we have. So I know that our ideals are responsible for great freedom in the world. Our military actions in World War II. You might have think we shouldn't have gotten into World War II. Are pivotal pivotal to many, many fulfilling lives in the world. If, uh, our technology, our, our, the engine of capitalism, our innovations, the fact that for free you can track yourself in a satellite in any place on planet Earth, this is uh, products of capitalism that are, that are re remarkable. I agree with you on that part. That, that these things, that, that, that the miserable people in the world should have the chance to benefit 
from and live lives, fulfilling lives on the order that we're living is something we should all want. And there is no system but our system to obtain that. So to spread that, you don't want to kill a few hundred thousand people. Well, you know what? I I don't want to kill a few hundred thousand. I definitely don't want to kill a few hundred thousand people and have it for nothing. There are trade-offs with lives. You know, the, the example I've used many times, like, you want to save civilians? Let's lower the speed limit to five miles an hour. You know, there are, if you start thinking about it that way, there are always trade-offs. We, we, we allow a lot of people to die on the highway for the greater good of what it accomplishes to people be able to travel at 55 and 70 miles an hour. These are impossible moral questions. People die. But if, if it could have been done, and the world for the next thousand years, 10,000, whatever, w- would be able to live all these fulfilling lives on the order of the way Americans have lived for a long time already, of course I'd have to say that was the right thing well, to do. Well, okay, I mean, I guess in in theory, I don't completely disagree. I mean, yeah, I think that, um, I think that uh, our capitalist model has produced a ton of wealth and that that has been spread around the world and that it's in many ways made the world a better place. Um, I'm not against the theoretical vision of, like, spreading liberty throughout the world. I don't think it should be done at the point of a gun. I don't think it should be done it's militarily. Be done. Well, I don't agree with that at all. And, in fact, just as you said, what you just said kind of contradicts that. We've spread our example. Our Americans' blue jeans and movies and music and culture has led to a freer world without any of the military stuff. Um, but that being said, when you paint this picture that, well, look, and I'm, I'm sure this this is true this applies to you. But when it's like, well, look, the goal here is we just want to make the world a better place. We want to raise the standard of living. We want to ima- allow for more liberty for people of the world. And therefore, it's like, oh, it's this horrible choice where maybe a few hundred thousand people have to die, but I hope it works out. I don't think that that in any way accurately describes this machine that is actually engaged in doing this. And the truth is that there are all of these like think tanks who are funded by weapons companies who come up with these policy papers that, oh, yeah, we really need to keep fighting this war. We really need to fight this war. We need to arm this country because it's a huge, insanely corrupt military-industrial complex. And so it's not as simple as like, oh, these are all these kind of benevolent figures who just really want to spread goodness. I don't think that's I, I, what the system there is. There is corruption and in pharma- pharmaceutical, any any organization, my own fucking organization, I find corruption. Like this is, this is, the, the, this is the nature of human beings. Okay. And it's shooting fish in a barrel to undermine any to undermine anything by finding the corruption within the organization. Yeah, but I'm not just saying like there exists. is some level of corruption. I'm saying there is enormous levels of corruption that are very responsible for driving so much so many of these policies. So I'm not saying like okay. oh there's there's some corruption at the comedy cellar like somebody, you know, some staff member is like hooking up with one of the comedians and then they get him more spots or something like that. I'm more like saying like the corruption whereas if like the whole thing was designed to lace the pockets of one person. And there was a, a, you know, like there was like, it turned out that you had been siphoning off five cents from everyone's pay and sending it into a secret account, right? (laughs) So I'm saying like, we're talking about levels of corruption. So I'm not just saying like, oh, there is some corruption in the military industrial complex, but hey, that can be said for any cafeteria. I'm saying the ungodly levels of corruption in there where literally they will put into action policies that that slaughter innocent people to line the pockets of very rich people okay is, but, but, Dave, is but people, rampant but at the time people like Christopher Hitchens who was quite aware of the military industrial complex was able to put all that knowledge and I'm sure he firmly believed in it in a certain perspective that still that still allowed him to think that the goal was correct He's not alive. I, I tend to think he would agree with everything I've said so far. I don't know if he... Quite had, possibly. But he didn't feel... Oh, that, I don't know where he was on Israel-Palestine. I, I don't know. I've read his stuff on he was, on uh, Iraq and on Kissinger. And he was anti-Israel, but I, I'm told by someone who knew him personally that towards the end of his life, he's, he's quoted as saying, my baggage has shifted on that one. But um, Well, he he got really into uh, in kind of critical of Islam in his yes, in his later yeah. years. So perhaps that that's where he was evolving to. So, I still think he was completely wrong to support Iraq War II and uh or the second the George W. Bush war in Iraq. Um so he was against the first one under H. W. Bush. 
But, uh, uh, June, Dave Smith, in, uh, Menachem Begas. So somebody tweeted at you, your inaccurate characterization of the Six-Day War should be corrected next time you're on Rogan. On Rogan. Um, you had said that, uh, what, what, what did you say? I don't have your quote here. You had said essentially that Israel chose to uh, invade. Uh, well, I said I said uh, a preemptive war, which I think is even what like the pro-Israel side describes it as, yeah. that they felt they had to preempt the war. So then you quote, so then you quote Menachem Begin saying, mm-hmm. in June 1967, we again had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations and the Sinai approaches do, do not prove that Nasser was really about to attack. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. Now, did you read that whole speech? Yes. Okay, so what was the point of that speech? Because it's the opposite of what you're saying. Well, no. I mean, he goes on. Look, he starts by saying the speech was about what the, the, the broader theme was, the wars of necessity and the wars of choice in Israel's history. And so he goes through the list of Not the wars Israel's that Not just Israel's history. Uh, okay, but so he's going through a list of like, these were wars of necessity, these were wars of choice. And I'm simply just making the point that he acknowledged this one is a war of choice. Now, yeah, he went on to say, but yes, it was a noble war, it was a defensive war in that sense, um, and that it, we were right to fight it. But he's just making the point that, no, we had a choice here. We, it wasn't imminent that we were going to be attacked. No, that's, that, he didn't say that. Well, in, what did I just say? What, what did you, that quote that you just read? He said it does not prove that Nasser was about to attack. Okay, fair, okay. That's not saying he wasn't about to attack. No, but saying that it wasn't it wasn't provable. It wasn't like it can't be provable. That so his point. So his point. He starts by talking about the Second World War. He says we waited in the Second World War until we had no choice. He said, but could we have avoided World War II and saved 30, 40, 50 million people? Of course we could have. We could have taken care of it. We could have taken care of Germany right away. We could have preemptively fought yeah, them. Yeah. Well, when we had— That's what preemptive means. Yeah, but I mean, there, there, was a, we, there was a legal— When we had—so so he said preemptive. Okay. So then he says, in 47, we waited, in, uh, and we lost all these people. In 73, we waited. He said, in 67, we had Kaushis Belli, meaning we had the legal right, but we didn't wait— and we lost very, very few people. Okay. And his point was that if you wait, it's immoral to wait because that's how you lose horrible numbers of people. Fair enough. I'm just saying that he, this guy took issue with me describing it as a preemptive war. And I'm saying, look, here is he in his I own words. It, but, so, but in his own words, he's like, no, he may also make the case that we were right to do that. I would disagree with him. Okay. But regardless, I think it's still kind of an admission there that he's saying like yeah we chose to but do no, this nobody war. disputes that it was a preemptive strike the question is is what would have happened had Israel done so nothing le, so let me so let me well let, yeah speaking of things we can't prove i mean yeah well, we don't so, know so so what happened egypt uh, for people who don't know egypt um asked ordered the un peacekeepers to leave there was there were peacekeepers mm-hmm. there after 1956 ordered the peacekeepers to leave mobilized 100 to 125,000 troops on the israeli border and close the Straits of Tehran. Mm-hmm. Did everything that an army would look like to do right before they're going to attack? Sure. Israel went into a panic, an absolute panic. They waited until America uh, g- gave the green light. And then when America finally said they were not going to open the Straits, Straits of Tehran, America finally, uh, e- Israel finally went in and uh, Blew up the uh, is- Israeli. The, I'm getting tired. Blew up the Egyptian Air Force and all that. And f- and and to note it that for uh, for a, a war where the enemy started on this footing, where they had like uh, amassed their army, um, Il- uh, Israel won this war in a matter of days. Now, when I debated this with Aaron Mate, mm-hmm. he says, "But you have to read the uh, the Iron Wall by Avi Shlaim. You have to read the uh, Iron Wall by Avi Shlaim." So I went and read the Iron Wall by Avi Shlaim. If I could have only one source to quote from, and that's the only source I would quote from, I would have been happy to choose that book. It made every point that I wanted to him. He talks about Nasser embarking on an exercise of brinksmanship. Uh, He took a terrible gamble and lost. Israel was paralyzed by fear and by conflicting currents of opinion. The two weeks were traumatic experience. Well, who could argue that Nasser took a, uh, that it backfired and was a bad decision? Traumatic experience of the Israeli public that went down in the history of the period of waiting. The nation succumbed to a collective psychosis. But this is what he says. He says, the Six-Day War was a defensive war. It was launched by Israel to safeguard its security, not to expand its territory. 
War aims. It just happened to. <laughs> war aims for terror emerged only in the course of fighting in a confusing, contradictory fashion. Yes, look, this is the defense Hol- minister for Israel. I'm not saying he's coming. No, out he's an pro- anti-Zionist. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was a. Oh, this okay. is, this I'm, is, I'm sorry. I, I'm just confused over. No, this is this is yeah. the anti-Zionist historian okay. that Aaron Mate recommended. Eshkol's government did everything in his power to confine the confrontation to the Egyptian front. They wanted to avoid a clash with Jordan and the inevitable complications of having to deal with a predominantly Palestinian population on the West Bank. The fighting on the Eastern Front was initiated by Jordan, not by Israel. King Hussein got carried along by the powerful currents. So, And you know the story. Israel contacted Jordan. Don't invade us. We have no problem with you. They even, is, is a, there's a great quote here. At first, the Israeli government had no intention. Of, oh, no, wait. At first, um, there's, there's some quote here. Oh, here it is. The Israeli reaction to the Jordanian shelling was restrained, even at the beginning, in the hopes that Hussein would desist after satisfying his honor. First, the Israeli government had no intention of capturing the West Bank. On the contrary, it was opposed to it. Second, there was not any provocation on the part of the IDF vis-a-vis Jordan. Third, the rain was only loosened when a real threat to Jerusalem's security emerged. This is how things truly happened on June the 5th, although it is difficult to believe. And, if, and, he, uh, and then he quotes a summation of a, a, an Israeli general that he endorses. First, oh, it's the same thing again, I'm reading it. So that's, okay. so, so, so very important for people listening. But so what's, what's the, the, West, the point of this? I, I the don't... point of this is that the war with Egypt was preemptive because okay. Egypt had amassed its troops on the border and had thrown the UN peacekeepers out and Israel decided not to wait. For instance, Finkelstein had said, Israel has nothing to worry about the tunnels. Israel has nothing to worry about the rockets. It's very easy to tell other people to to not be worried about things. But when a nation provokes, you're worried about America's provocations. Let's talk about the provocation of a hundred, if we yeah, but, but put a, if we put a hundred thousand people into Ukraine, you'd be screaming provocation. Yes, but here's the thing. So well, let me finish. Uh, let me finish. Uh, okay. But all that has nothing to do with the West Bank. Israel did not take the West Bank in a war of of a, a, Land, pre- a preemptive right. war. Israel took the West Bank in a defensive war. Not only a defensive war, but a war they asked them to keep out of, okay. and then at first even allowed for some face saving measures. This is, and this is the key fact to the occupation. This was thrust on Israel. Okay. It has nothing to do well, with Egypt. Okay, all right, listen, a few things there. Number one, so it's like, if you're asking me, was, was the Egyptian military mobilizations a provocation of Israel? Of course, and you'd be an insane person to say that it wasn't. And if I was a prominent podcaster in Egypt at the time, I'd be like, let's not make this move. This might result in a war that'll be bad for us, which it did end up resulting in, right? So I'm just saying that- But Israel also- actually had legal right to, to, uh, to evade. Okay, re- regardless You're, of that, I'm just Russia making didn't. the point- Russia didn't. Uh, Russia signed okay, the treaty. Okay, fine. Fair enough. I mean, if you want to talk about legal right, there's plenty of things that Israel does that they don't have a legal right to I do right want to talk to about do. legal right. Okay, fine. But there's plenty of things Israel does that they don't have a legal right we to can do. Get to that. There's plenty of things that the United States of America does that it doesn't have a legal right no, to do. No. So it, regardless of that, I'm just making the point that it's not like a yes, I would I would say that's a provocation. It was a very stupid move. Now, if you want to put I'll be I'll be honest and I'll I'll just I don't know enough about the way the um the way the eastern half of that war started. So if you want to say that Israel preempted the war that led to the Six Day War, but they only preempted with Egypt and not with Jordan. You might be right about that. I just don't know enough about that. To, but I'll take you at your word, right? No, no, there. you should read fine. about it. It's, it's a it's, very, so very. I've read. Fact. I've read a lot about the the Six Day War, but I, I will, I'll grant you that point. But that being said, I don't think even necessarily if you want to make the argument that um, Israel didn't start the war with the intention of of taking control of of Gaza and the West Bank um, and East Jerusalem. And if you want to say that um, the, the occupation was kind of forced on Israel at that point, even if you accept that, the fact that they've dominated these areas ever since is what's unacceptable. That well, they're at a certain point, you can't just be like, we won a war in 1967, and now we have you have no rights 
to any type of sovereignty over these areas. Whether whether we occupy you with the IDF is our choice. We will do that whenever we want to. How much of everything gets into your country is our choice. That's Gaza. That's, yeah. Yes, yeah. that's uh, yeah. what I'm saying. Or, or uh, you know, the West Bank. They but, occupied Gaza right, at one but, point. But both sides have to be sense. willing to make a deal. Well, yes, I would agree with that, too. But I also don't think that the pro- You, you said on one of your podcasts that, that, that Hamas has agreed to recognize Israel. That's not true. Oh, they, oh, they I said that at points they had. No, they never had. That's not Absolutely true. You can hear them on the Charlie Rose show, leaders in Hamas saying we recognize Israel under 67 borders. No, they, they 100%, have- 100% that's a fact. No. Anybody go find the clip. It's out there on the internet. They have- On the Charlie Rose show, Hamas leaders saying we recognize Israel under 67 borders. Now, don't get me wrong. No. That's not what they said when they were first created, and I'm sure that's not what they're saying right now. It's but not- I'm just saying there, there was, was a point. There was one guy who was interviewed uh, that had said something like that. By the way, you should, we, it's, it's worth it. Talking about what that means, but then they then the reporter contacted the Hamas leadership and is like, no, no, it's in an interview, it's in a live interview that he says this. With Any, Charlie anytime Rose. somebody on uh, on Hamas has said something off script like that, it is it has always been quickly, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, retracted, ret- not retracted, no, it's uh, can- disassociated. They, they they quickly disassociated themselves from whatever the guy said. It has never been an official statement by anybody who speaks for Hamas saying so. The most recent document they have, it does talk about they'd be willing to have Israel in 67 borders. However, it says, but we will never recognize Israel and Palestine from the river to the sea is an integral uh, unit, meaning we will never give up the right to try to to get disclaim, the rest I of it. Disclaim, I think your word is disclaim. Is yeah. The word disclaim. Word. So, meaning, so, Hamas me, is a bad me, group. Meaning... <laughs> Benjamin Netanyahu why, shouldn't why, have uh, stated that they should support them. Oh, we can talk about, meaning, why would they not uh, want to allow Israel to go back to 67 borders? If they don't have to give anything up for it, Israel will retreat to 67 borders, give us back your holy sites, give us back the Golan, give us back all the, all the geographically strategic important areas, and we will never have to recognize you, don't agree, make peace with you, and don't agree that your country oh. is not our country. That's nothing. No, I'm not saying that that's that's a better word. Denounce, I think, is what you were looking for. Uh, There's, uh, I'm not saying that those, if those were the terms of a deal, that would be. But that's that's all. But Hamas has never said anything beyond that. Uh, Sure, we'll take, we'll allow 67 borders. Oh no, well, okay. It started by you saying that Hamas has never said that, but they have said that. Now I don't know how quickly after that they walked back those comments. I know there's been a couple points where they've been made. Regardless, yes, I don't think Hamas is a great partner to uh, negotiate with. No, I I don't think the Likud party is very good either. To be honest, now as far as propping up Hamas, the last can I just just, yeah, and that's why. I just had an interesting yeah. question. I, a yeah. uh, personal question is: yeah. You were a very young when the Six Day War broke out. You're probably five years old. Yes, but I would imagine in Why your didn't house. You serve? <laughs> I would imagine in your house <laughs> um, yeah. that loomed large. I was wondering if that's in any early memories you had. Absolutely, it loomed large. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember uh, when I was a teenager. Yeah. Was when uh, the um, Bill Clinton. I remember seeing on TV when he had Yitzhak Rabin and Yatser Arafat, and they had that nice. Uh, Thing and they were like, uh, they were like, Bill Clinton signs a historic peace process thing, and I remember as a teenager thinking, well, it's good that's settled. <laughs> Let's talk about propping up Hamas. All right, we got that one taken care of. Let's move on to the I next. I thought maybe you had more to say about what was going on in your house in 1960. Well, my, listen, <laughs> Israel was always the the number one issue in my home, and it, it, well, Israel and civil rights were the, actually the two issues, and. Um, and, and those are what I remember very much from a boy. I remember, I've told you, I remember very much when Martin Luther King died. And I remember very much and, and, how, and, and how my father was happy when George Wallace got shot. And I, and I remembered things like that. And I also remember how important Israel was. But I also remember it wasn't until I was much older that I ever met an Israeli who was not yearning for the idea that the Arabs would agree to peace. It was, it was such a ubiquitous feeling among 100% of every Israeli I ever met until the second intifada, until that disillusionment happened, when many people began to say, you know what, like Benny Morris, we, we've, we've been wrong here. They're never, they're, they're never going to change. So we are going to veer off in our own direction and maybe someday this fever will break and maybe someday it won't. But there's nothing we can do. Now, that doesn't make them right. No, it doesn't. And it doesn't seem to have worked out too well. Well, I don't know what the alternatives were. Yeah, I suppose you can but, always say that. But, but um, like, like the idea of just like, well, 
that's it. We have to walk away from any process that will even uh, hold out hope of one day having a- autonomy for these people. Is this crazy? Is it crazy to say that, well, is that the that Mahmoud Abbas would get on TV and say, people of Israel, people are dying. It's awful. In 2007, your prime minister, Ehud Olmert, offered us blah, 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 blah. For whatever reason, that didn't go anywhere. We call upon the Israeli government now to come back to the table and enter into negotiations based on that deal we almost made. He would never do it. Yeah, that would that would definitely be a lot better. And I think, well, look, and here, that's, here's and, the thing, right? And that's all he has to do. But here's the thing, right? No, so it's it's like this. Like, you agree it's all he has to do? N- well, uh, no, I don't know that that's all he has to do. I think it would be great if he would do that. Do you understand that the Israeli that, public I, I, would throw Netanyahu out in a well, heartbeat? Look, but here's the thing, right? <laughs> So the the dynamic with terrorism is always like this. And in fact, I think this has been uh, pretty clearly shown over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks. But what was the goal of October 7th? Like, aside from just the fact that, like, okay— To provoke Israel into killing a lot of civilians. Yes, exactly. Exactly. In the same sense that, why did Osama bin Laden, and he wrote a bunch about this too, right? Like, why did he hit us on 9-11? He never had any dream that, like, he could destroy the United States of America. He was trying to recreate what we helped train him to do to the Soviet Union. No, I don't agree with that. Well, he he wrote about it, and he was trying to lure them into a war in Afghanistan. And he thought he could do that, and he was particularly happy— at least this is what his son said— he was particularly happy when George W. W. Bush was elected because he was like, oh, this guy will definitely invade Afghanistan. Let's not get sung up a lot. Okay, but, but he also the said, goal of the, he also said when we bombed the barracks, America pulled out. America's a paper tiger. America, well, he wanted, America doesn't have the stomach it's, it's to stay, sounds, stay in the Middle East. It sounds like death. that. Okay, so yeah. it sounds like that's paradoxical, but if you actually look at it, there, it's basically the same thing. Okay. That he thought he could lure us in, we'd be too scared, we'd bankrupt ourselves too much, and then we'd ultimately completely okay. remove from but the region. Ha- ha- anyway, Hamas wanted this reaction, and look, look how well it's worked out yeah. for their propaganda campaign. Yeah. They've turned global opinion against Israel in the most dramatic way I ever could have imagined well, in my listen, lifetime. I'll say this, I think Israel's existence is in more jeopardy right now than it's ever been in my lifetime. So, Maybe not in, in yours, but certainly in, in mine, because, I mean, this is, I'm born in the 80s. I have some sympathy for what you're saying. So the thing is then, to be wise, if you're Israel, don't be George W. Bush like an idiot and just like a bull in a china shop, go run around and give them what they want. And look, the truth is, to what you were saying, right? You're right. It would be a better world if They're not if giving them Hamas quite what would, they want. Well, okay, but it would be a better world if Hamas, maybe not 100%, but they're giving them a lot of it. Um, it would be a better world if Hamas would stand up and say, listen, Let's go back to Oslo. Let's like work Hamas on a real. Do that. They're not going to. It would also be a better world if the Likud party strategy wouldn't just be like, we already offered it to you. So too bad. And by the way, if you do go listen, which I'm sure you've heard the, that uh, secret Benjamin Netanyahu tape. Yeah, I want to talk about that. So it's not as if, look, he he openly kind of is bragging to other Israelis about all the poison pills that were in those deals me, to begin let me, let, with. Let me answer you and let's get to that. Sure. I'm not afraid of that. So. And I'm not. I don't want to defend Netanyahu. Like, you know, Listen, most Jews I know, even in my family, most like very pro-Israel Jews are pretty critical of Netanyahu. Are critical of settlements. Are critical of settlements, the fact especially. That, well, yeah. uh, they, there's a lot of even not liberal Jews who are very critical of that approach. Also, this the approach. Hold on, let me get it. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. So, and this is also Bin Laden, and I've read this places. Hamas intended to provoke an Israeli reaction. They never expected this level of reaction. They did not intend to jeopardize their entire organization's future in Gaza. They miscalculated, just like bin Laden did not intend to spend the rest of his life in a cave until he died. So they miscalculated. Bin Laden thought uh, he'd seen in the past these provocations, America reacts and and then stops. Hamas had seen there's a flare up, whatever it is. They probably, in their own mind, like 9 11, didn't actually believe it was going to happen. Like it's on the drawing board, but they didn't really expect the trade centers to come but down. They didn't think it would they, collapse. They didn't really expect to, to have this tremendous success. They've internalized some of the Israelis. No, they've said that stuff. too. Yeah. They, they yeah. were not anticipating so, that level. So, of- on one side of the ledger, I 100% agree with you. And I said on the day it happened, if, it, if, if Israel decided to do, do nothing, remember I said that to Brett Stevens? If Israel decided to do nothing now, I wouldn't question it because, because I'd said that. That where Israel has sympathy today, but you're about to see daily yeah. George Floyd videos and a worldwide defund the police reaction. And and look, wait, wait, wait. I'm not, well, I'm not, I, but I'll just say, and it's. I mean, I'm not. I was not a supporter of Black Lives Matter or any other rioting or anything like that. 
But you certainly understand where seeing that video yes, would I create a reaction. And you understand where seeing all however, these images of what's happening to Gaza however, is going to have this ha response. However, that's one side of the ledger. Sure. Is what Israel's facing now, PR-wise and all that. On the other side of the ledger, in their mind is, well, if we're going to do this, it can't. we're not going to fucking fuck up our, uh, our, our reputation and have everybody hate us for nothing. We have to get rid of Hamas. We have to get rid of Hamas. Yeah, but the, the, well, and, and, and I respect that, too. Now, you have criticized Netanyahu for propping up Hamas, which the logical inference from that would be he should have wanted to get rid of Hamas. So what does the world look like if he doesn't prop up Hamas? It's a, it, should, it should be a Hamasless world. So, like, from a Zionist point of view, I understand the, the, uh, the, the criticism of propping up Hamas. But from, from an outsider, it's like, well, if you're criticizing him for, for propping up Hamas, you should be happy they're getting rid of Hamas. No, that doesn't make any sense, no. Listen, I'm saying, look. Why doesn't for, that make sense? Because if getting rid of Hamas was just getting rid of Hamas, then fine, you would be happy with that. If getting rid of Hamas means slaughtering How, innocent... What are the ways there to get rid of well, them? Well, right, but if it means that, then I'm saying, no, I don't support that, okay? So like, then that's, maybe he was right. So, that, so, so No, 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 hold on. This let, just, let, let I'll let you... Get, I'll, so right. then, first of all, I want to tell you about what the other prime ministers did. It wasn't just Netanyahu. Okay, but let me like, re like, like let's let me get a point off but, to some of this. Uh, uh, let, oh, let me, okay. uh, two more seconds. I'll let, and I'll sure. let you talk. They were trying to buy off Hamas, the way we tried to buy Iran off, to try to calm this, appease them. That's what propping Hamas, propping up Hamas meant. There was criticism from the right for propping up Hamas, which is why he said, listen, you guys don't want a two-state solution. If you really don't want a two-state solution, you should be happy I'm, I'm giving Hamas money because as long as Hamas is in power, you won't ever have to worry about that. And from the left, he was telling people, listen, you guys should be happy I'm doing this because you're worried about— uh, Right. So, okay, but what he said to the Likud party, to your yeah. fair point, kind of the right-wingers there, anyone who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support bolstering Hamas and transferring money to Hamas. Right. This is part of our strategy, to isolate the Palestinians in Gaza from the Palestinians in the West Bank. So what Benjamin Netanyahu did, and what he said after that later in the quote is, we control the height of the flame. Meaning, because people were going like, but isn't this kind of dangerous to prop up a terrorist organization on your border? And he goes, yeah, 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 but we can control the thing. So just to be clear, this is not this is not Yitzhak Rabin who, okay, stated that he wanted to have a peace process and wanted to give uh, the Palestinians their own state. Now there's, as we were talking about in those Oslo Accords, it wasn't exact, it's not what the pro-Israeli side says, that we offered them everything and they just said no. It there was is, actually, there, it no, it's really new, There's a new book and, out and, now by, okay, by, by but, a guy who was there. Uh, okay, there's... That's absolutely not what it was, and we can go through some of the, the stuff on that. But regardless of that, he was at least saying that. Benjamin Netanyahu here is saying, in order to make sure we never give these people their independence, we are going to support the most violent radical Islamists amongst them because that's good for our strategy What do you mean by support? What, was the, how did, what, what, what support? Well, like? what, what he meant by support was, I think, essentially uh, making sure— that we they didn't stop money flowing into them from Qatar, withholding funds from the funds from the Palestinian Authority. But look, you don't maybe you don't agree with it, You're, but argue with his quote right here. That's what he's saying. No, he so I'll to I have the answer. So, so, any, so I, I asked an Israeli political analyst about that, mm -hmm. and he said it could be what you're saying. He said it could also just, as I said, he it could also be just him giving red meat to his crazy right wing flank. Okay, but that's that in it, itself like, is kind of an issue. Well, that that's their red meat? Is but, that to support this group and then use this same group as the excuse for why we don't have to have any respect for the, the innocent lives here? How and did you see the latest uh whatever? Let, let me just say the other thing to your because yeah, this is the counter me, to yeah. your point, right? Yeah. Is that it's like, yes, it would be great if you saw a Palestinian leadership ste stepping up and saying something like that. But what if Israel didn't throw away whatever goodwill they might have had on October 7th. And all those people, even by October 8th, who are like, oh, we're about to see a bloodbath in Gaza right now. What if they stepped up and went, listen, no, this is what we're going to do, okay? These guys who were involved in October 7th, that's it. We have to get them. We have, But we're going to fight them the same way we dealt with terrorism through all of Israel's history before Netanyahu, which wasn't these, like, indiscriminate bombing campaigns in Not Gaza. Not indiscriminate bombing. Okay, okay, fine. It was... 
It wasn't the less than ideally discriminant level of bombing campaigns. And by the way, we could get into You just said that Hamas purposely uh, yes, wants civilians saying, to die. So how so, No, I agree with so that. So the number of Hamas killed is, is, bad, is pretty low. No, no, but the number is pretty low. What country has ever had to fight a uh, okay. country that well, wants let, its let own people killed? So just imagine then if Israel had had risen above that and said, you know what, this is the most surveilled area in the world. We're going to do our best to pick these people out like we have historically done yep. fighting terrorism before Netanyahu's government. That They never did these type of, of military exercises. We're going to do our best to do that, but then we are going to bend over backward to ensure you that we are doing the most we can to make sure innocent women and children and men aren't killed. And we have, here's the real offer right now. You know what we always say we offered you back in the day? Here's the offer as soon as these guys from October 7th are taken out. They had an opportunity there too. And so it's easy And what to about the here. hostages? Well, yeah, and, and be negotiating yeah, for right. hostages yeah. the whole time. So, of course. so let me tell you. I don't know that what you're saying is ridiculous. I don't, I don't, I, I like, I mean, I had said it like maybe doing nothing is a powerful statement well, well just to add to it though just to say after 9 11 the world in ma many parts of the world that you wouldn't have imagined like really kind of mourned for america even in okay. iran yeah. they had like sixty thousand people having a moment of silence at their biggest soccer stadium and then we went on this 20-year murder okay. fest and we we blew all of that but, goodwill but, but i i, I want to say that i don't know that you're wrong but you know these kind of um pie in the sky ideas Sometimes they don't survive contact with the, with the real world. Uh, yeah, well, but, sometimes sometimes these wars don't survive contact with the real world. But, sometimes they result uh, in disaster. Now, now I want to make a couple points. There's, um, which one first? There's a difference between America and Israel, in that America sent its standing army. Israel shuts down. The entire country is shut down right now. So they, it's horrible to say they don't have the leisure to take their time, go in, secure this street. It could take years, right? So however you want to factor that in, you have to just understand that that is a factor. When, when, they, when they're planning wars, America's planners never had to say, well, listen, but the entire country's locked down now. It's essentially like a lockdown. Every, every, everybody's closed. Like, every male under every the male age of 40 We can't have every male gone. at war for five years, right? Okay, but— but Let me make my point. Sure, sure, sure. But as far as propping up Hamas, the accusation was, one, allowing cash in. Now, I think it's absurd to think that a country that can smuggle in rocket components to build tens of thousands of rockets can't smuggle in cash. I don't believe that Israel was the reason that they, that, uh, they couldn't get cash in. I just don't believe that. They get, no, there's lots of things they can't they get, get in because of Israel, so they, I, I don't know. No, they get everything in, obviously. Because no, they don't still, get everything in. They, they're not supposed to, but they do. And they, no, no, they don't get everything in. They get some things through. because yes, They like have any tens of security. thousands of rockets that they every single thing that not goes all in, of that was imported though. I mean, some of that is they've dug up pipes and stuff like that. But much of it is with material. You can't build this stuff without components that are not available in Gaza. Number one. Number two. The previous prime minister Lapid had the exact same prop up Hamas policies. This is from Times of Israel. As part of his strategy, Israel issued permits to 14,000 Gaza workers to enter Israel with the promise of handing out more if the situation remains calm. Every single thing that I'm not going to, we've been on so long, I have a bunch of quotes here, but I'm not going to go on and on about it. Um, uh, and, and Lapid said to them, he gave a speech at the UN, a la what you were saying, um, an agreement with the Palestinians based on two states for two peoples is the right thing for Israel's security, for Israel's economy, and for the future of our children, in his first speech to the UN Assembly. Despite all the obstacles still today, a large majority of Israelis support the vision of a two-state solution. I have one of them. Lapid said that member states have asked Israel several times why it will not lift the restrictions on the Gaza Strip. Quote, we're ready to do more than that. I say from here to the people of Gaza, we're ready to help you build a better life, to build an economy. We presented a comprehensive plan to help rebuild Gaza. We have only one condition. Stop firing rockets and missiles at our children. Put down your weapons. There will be no restrictions. The Israeli prime minister did say, this is just two years ago, exactly what you're, you're saying. saying that, that prime minister say. also propped up Hamas? And, 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 he, and, and he was answered with rockets. At some point, you have to be open to the idea 
that they just may not want it. Wait, what was Lapid's rationale for propping up Hamas? Because it's, it's not propping up. The, the, the rationale is these people need money. Okay, but I mean— And, like, and, if, I, and if maybe if we can give them jobs— that will that will calm them. Yeah. Okay. But listen, Benjamin Netanyahu. Again, you're not arguing with me. You're arguing with his own words. He's saying no. That's not why we're supporting them. We're supporting them because we want to thwart the ability to ever give. Right, but them I'm a saying free if it, look, it would be nice. Okay. If, fine. If, if, but I'm saying when when, when I'm not that, saying that's a good quote. I wish there were more quotes like that. Right, I but, wish more people were but saying. Can that. you understand but, what the quote says? Yes. But can you? We're gonna make. We're not gonna just do it again. We said it a year ago, and we got rockets. Okay. At some point, you don't. You just you don't keep doing it. At some point, it's their balls in their court. Yeah. But well, remember that. Speech, but why you, can't you just say the same thing? But reversed. Why is it got to be this standard? Is that like if any Palestinian kid throws a rock until you make sure that never happens, we get to dominate you forever? Let me just ask you this, Noam. Why does Israel have a right to do this? To do what? To, why do they have a right to say, under these conditions, we therefore allow you to be a government? But until then, we don't. We dominate because you. Because they want. Well, is it because they won a war in 1967? No, because they're shooting rockets. Okay, okay. well, Israel bombs regularly. The, the, uh, forget even the response from October 7th. There's all types of different military actions that Israel's taken against them. Do they have a right now? Oh, isn't it the same logic to well, say I'll, they have I'll a right answer, to fight I'll, back? I'll answer you. It's very interesting. So it came out in the papers that Israel had the whole plan and it was sitting on a shelf uh -huh. somewhere. And worse than that, that not only they had the plan, but then there were intelligence reports that they were actively like practicing yeah, yeah, yeah. for it and it's stuff. It's pretty bad. It's, it's pretty bad. But it begs the question, if Israel had taken it seriously, what would it have looked like to thwart it? And what would people like you be saying if Israel had taken those measures? It would have looked awful. Israel would have been saying they were about to invade. People like I won't, I won't include people like the gray zone be saying this is bullshit. Israel, it, 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 it you're, it's an impossible situation. The look of yeah, but I'm, I'm not even disagreeing with you. Get that, my point. The but, look of preventing it, yeah, but it's is an, horrible, right? But it's an impossible situation. But you're only looking at it from the Israeli perspective. And there's also a Palestinian perspective where it goes, this is an impossible situation no, to accept no, that not. we just have to live under this they until you think there would be a blockade if if there was no violence from Gaza. Why would why would Israel be, want to waste their time with walls and block? They don't have it in the West Bank. But see, this is again, this is you're you're, you're well, kind of wall, like yeah. proving like my point here, where it's like you're looking at this from the Israeli perspective and saying um, you don't care about provocations. You'll, you, you, you somehow you care about America's provocation by saying something to to, to to to. But actual rockets coming in, that's not sufficient provocation to say. You I'm know what? Saying, you Hamas, you really should be. I'm not saying that's not a, this. I'm not saying that's a provocation, and I'm not saying Hamas isn't responsible for that. What I'm saying is that there's also another side to this story, and Israel's also responsible for a whole lot too. And to think that these people who have grown up in a situation where they're utterly dominated by a foreign kind of foreign power yes. is um, something that is going to— And then the standard is that in this situation where you're being dominated, until not one person here, which you can't really control, one person launches a rocket, oh, you lose no, all of it your would, freedom, too. It wouldn't too. be just one. They, they send Yes, I'm just saying that the standard can't be that, like, you, we will finally make a deal when your side is completely clean. They, I don't think that's a reasonable standard. Uh, I, and I don't think—I I mean, listen, why, why is it that we just accept— that like Israel has a right to continue doing this. I told you because the, the rockets are coming in. Every country. Has okay, the but right then why? But then why by that? Okay, but by that logic, why do, do the Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? Because there's been plenty of Israeli aggression toward them as well. Uh, Palestinians have a right to defend themselves. Okay. They don't. They don't. Have, they don't. Have, they don't have a right to uh, slaughter as they did. I would say. Yeah, they don't have a right to kill innocent people. Th exactly. Also, but I would, exactly. I'd say that's true on both sides. But I would say that. This is an interesting question you're raising. I would say that the, the obligation now, they don't have a right to send rockets into Israel unless they are have the intention of wanting to make a, a peace agreement with Israel. Do they, do they have a right? Listen to, listen to what sure. I'm saying. It's very important because if Israel is saying, we're never going to, uh, uh, we don't want to make peace with you. We're going to occupy you forever. Then, it, then the Palestinians have 100% right to send rockets into Israel. But if Hamas is the one saying we never want to make peace, 
And Israel's the one saying, we're not going to do this, as Lapid said, until you're ready to make peace. Then no, they don't so, have a moral so, okay, right. So they I, don't I wanna, have a moral I wanna, right. Do so you agree with saying, me? Uh, well, no, not necessarily. I'd have to parse this through, but let me ask you a, a question. So you're saying if Israel said, we're going to occupy you indefinitely, then they would have a right to just attack the country of Israel Absolutely. as self-defense. Okay, so what if Israel doesn't say that, but they've been doing it since 1967? But they haven't been. They've, they've over and over again come to the table— there were very few windows of opportunity when the in sixty seven there, there was. But so, but you see my point though. That I I'm see your point. But so if they say the right thing but occupy you, then you don't have a no, right. No, no. If it's if it's does, if does it's someone, a lie, let me say this, say, if it's the, a lie, the then they have thing. the same right. Do they have the right if the IDF comes into Palestinian territory, not even on an anti terror campaign, just during one of the many occupations, right? So Gaza pre two thousand five or in the West Bank or something like that, and they come in to their territory and start yelling curfew and pushing people around and telling them when they can go inside and when they can't, do they have a right to defend themselves against those guys? Do they have a right to kill one of them? <clears throat> if we, if a foreign uh, soldier I, 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 if a foreign soldier came into my uh, house and started yelling at my wife to get inside the house, I would try to kill that guy. Do yeah. I have a right to do that? Do they have a right to do that to the IDF? Uh, they might. I, 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 it's a tough question because— I'm going to get you in trouble with our people. If I no. got to go, if I got to go down, you're going well, down with every, me. Well, every every individual has a right to kill themselves. What, what you're describing is not is does not warrant the use of deadly force under any system of law. Screaming at somebody to go into curfew, you're not allowed to kill at somebody. At gunpoint, at, at uh, they're at, pointing a gun at your wife. Uh, even at gunpoint, I don't think a, you'd a have, member of a foreign military comes and points a gun at my wife. If I have a gun in my hand, I'm, I'm, I'm giving the legal standard. I, I'm not again. I'm I'm thinking it through. The legal standard is you have a right to use deadly force if someone's about to use deadly force to you. If some if if, if a law enforcement pointing a gun at you would in almost every jurisdiction be a reasonable. No, if, if a uh, law if crime. a law enforcement officer and under occupation, Israel is responsible for law enforcement. Right. So well, if if it's someone who gets an extra kind of. Uh, an extra level of like a supernatural rights type deal. So like the way a cop could do it to you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But at least the exception, and I don't really buy into this cause I'm like a radical no, but libertarian, I, I, but at least the idea with our police officers, right? Is that the reason why they have a right to do that to you is because we have free and fair elections and we get some say in how our government is run. And right. so theoretically we delegate this power to the cops, but none of that is true but this is in the why, West Bank or Gaza. They why, have no say in this. This is why, the origin of the occupation is so important because no matter what is if if your people are the one who attacked as opposed to the ones being attacked that is a different story and it's a, and it's a different moral thing and if but there's no statute of limitations on that and you we know should, what i mean after this we should we should uh, exchange materials to read and after and after which if your people i'll, I'll read you just one there was a there was a letter that Arafat's one of Arafat's ministers um, wrote an open mm -hmm. letter. He was shot after he wrote the letter. He wrote an open letter about the peace process to Arafat. It contains the following sentences. Yeah, I've I've read this. But go ahead, read. It. Were we honest about what we did? Were we right in what we did? No, we were not. Didn't we jump for joy over the failure of Camp David? Didn't we throw mud at the picture of President Clinton, who dared to submit a proposal for a state with some modifications? How many times were we asked to do something that we could do, but we didn't do it? We did not do it. We have committed a serious mistake against our people, authority, and the dream of the establishment of our state. If that is an accurate depiction of what went on, then that affects the rights of these people. If 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 this was an Israeli cabinet minister who wrote a letter to Barack after that, we would all say, "Fuck the Israelis." Their own man wrote a letter. Well, hold on, but wait, we have Netanyahu on video. He doesn't know he's being recorded, saying that, "Ah, don't worry about Oslo. We got the final say on how to interpret yeah, that." Yeah. And I was going to interpret most of the entire West Bank as being one of these militarized zones. So don't you worry. We, so we but, do but, have but, kind of a version of that. Yes, By the way, but Oslo. We, but but Netanyahu was was not. Not there at the various chapters when there actually was a Palestinian. Well, he was at some in in some of them at some level. The, the, ma the major but negotiation. Yes. But okay, but look, I'm just making the point that I I I love this quote here, right? And there's something to it where he's going like, "Look, our problems aside." We were offered something. We shouldn't have walked away. We no, should have maybe. We were, he said we were dishonest. Right. Sure. That, and he's saying like, listen, we should have taken this and seen what Ukraine we could would be get happy for it. our deal. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, more or, or, less. or however, or, but, Dave or, Smith, Ukraine or, says Ukraine should look, take the deal. We should. And take what it. happened to him? And what happened to him? Who? 
he got killed. He got shot. By, and what right. happened to Yitzhak Rabin? That's different. He, well, I'm just saying, the, the people who try to make peace, then it's Yitzhak different. Rabin gets, gets murdered by a right-wing uh, Israeli. Yitzhak Rabin got murdered. No other Israeli prime minister got murdered. But Arafat, if you read the accounts, Arafat was worried about assassination throughout Every bit of the negotiation, he kept saying, you're going to get me killed. You're going to get me killed. Yes. Yeah, oh, sure, sure. The yeah, Israeli no, I, prime minister was not. Oh, yeah. Well, look, his situation is much more unstable. It's an outlier that, in it's, it's, it's a much more unstable situation that the Palestinians are in compared to the Israelis. So I think that's well, I was just going to say, I'm, even assuming the deal was not a great deal— was there a counteroffer made? Was no, there was no counteroffer. Well, I mean, there's look, there's debates about this, and there's been uh, um, different accounts of it. But no, essentially— that the it is true that um, Arafat ultimately walked away can from, I, can I from tell the, you something? the deal. You don't know me well enough to know how how sincere this is. I did such a deep dive on this debate. I bought every single every single book, and then I checked the original sources of every single book. I bought Khalidi's book. I checked his footnotes. He's got nothing. Every single claim of this other side of the debate leads to a brick wall dead end where you can't you cannot find a single actual fact with regard to Be, what precisely with regard to the fact Oslo that accords that no, the, uh, Camp David and under Ulmer. okay every single fact makes it clear to me that the Israeli story here is true and the Palestinian story is revisionist I say that I would almost stake my own kids I can well, well, again at least with the Oslo stuff that's not what Netanyahu said no, Oslo Oslo was before Oslo was under Rabin. I'm talking about when they actually with Clinton was there and then when Olmert was there they tried everything Shlomo Ben Ami who Mate and Finkelstein like to take one quote that he says about how I wouldn't have accepted that deal he's written at length that he says, never has the world, I have it here somewhere, um, he says, it is unlikely that the world has ever witnessed such an extensive effort aimed to pers trying to persuade the leader of a national movement to overcome his fears, pluck up his coverage, and come to a decision worthy of a peacemaker. It was all in vain. What was shocking to me, however, was that there was no sadness in the Palestinian negotiators' face, no sorrow over a lost opportunity. The refugees' right of return was a historical impossibility. Why did they themselves not encourage refugees to live in Palestinian state? I asked myself, what kind of national movement dreams of establishing a state only in order to settle its exiles in a neighborhood, neighboring country? How is that a national movement? That does not build an ethos based on ingathering its exiles. This guy was in the room every day. This is a peacemaker guy. This is a guy whose eyes fill with tears. And he's a guy who's made, he calls Barack arrogant. I mean, he's, 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 he's unflinching. But when it comes down to the essence of it all, even Indic, everybody says, Arafat never came prepared to make a deal. And... If you don't believe the Israelis, we have one of Arafat's cronies saying it. So I'm asking you to open your eyes. Maybe it's fucking true. Maybe I am. I am very. I'm Jewish. I was raised an Israeli, but I'm a fucking honest person. I I will turn my. I I will face the truth. I didn't want it to be true. I I will open the book with dread. Like, am I going to read something that's going to upend what I feel about it? I. But I'm telling you, I spent hundreds of dollars. I cannot find it. Is Netanyahu, Netanyahu is a Jabotinsky guy. I, I don't know where Netanyahu is. I spoke to someone once who knows him, who said, I believe he would want a two-state solution if there was a real one to be had. But I don't, I don't know what the fuck. He, he's more concerned with staying out of jail and staying in power right now. Yeah, but look, I mean, okay, but that guy is the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history. So what Yeah, but he, he was says, out just a year so, ago. Yeah, okay, but he's had the longest run and then he's right back in, as <laughs> typically. Um, but I'm just saying, what he, his view on this matters too. And what he's telling you in his own words is that he also doesn't want a two-state solution. No, it solution. doesn't matter. I'll prove to you why. Who was the prime minister when Sadat wanted to make peace? Uh, what's the Na Menachem Begin. Right, yeah, Begin. Okay. That era's Benjamin Netanyahu. He was a fucking terrorist. There was no more right wing finger figure in Israel's history. But as soon as uh, yeah, but, oh, uh, Sadat but just... indicated he wanted peace, Begin came okay, along. Okay, fine. But you're just, you're uh, you're kind. Of, right, and by the way, only, only Nixon can go to China. It would be very smart. Very smart. For them to make the move to try to make Netanyahu the guy that who 
who they put on the spot when they say they want to make peace, rather than have Netanyahu and the opposition saying they're going to risk well, that, your country. Okay, so that I agree with completely. But they don't but do again, it. Again, but you're kind of just brushing away. You're letting away them the, off the hook. They can on, say I'm something. Just, but you're, well, I'm not letting them off the hook. I'm not saying like, yes, I wish many of the Palestinian leaders had behaved in drastically different ways over the years. It would be a much better situation probably if they had. I also think that like this is one of these weird situations where everybody undercuts their own point to such a large degree, like even that guy, like say, like at the um, say at the rally that you brought up before, before you found out he was like mentally ill or whatever. Like, let's just say because there have been some people who have said some pretty horrible things, you know. And you're just like, what's your feeling as a pro-Israel guy when you see someone saying that? You're like, dude, shut up because I'm you're I'm making I'm us I'm look so bad, and this is not I'm representing ashamed. my. Yes, it's horrible, and I'm sure. And there's lots of for people who are on the pro, uh, you know, the pro-Palestinian side or whatever you want to call it. I'm sure there's lots of people who see some of the stuff shouted at these rallies, and they're like, Jesus Christ, man! Like, of course, you are just totally undercutting your own position here. So I'm not denying that there's like some culpability on a lot of the the Arab uh, leadership here. The point more to me is that it's like, you can't deny this other half of it too, which is that again, the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history is sitting here in his own words telling you that we're doing everything to undermine the peace process, that we don't actually want a peace process, that in fact our strategy is to avoid it ever uh, being okay, achieved. Let's, let's assume- and the, the, the thing I'll say is this, because I do, I got to run over okay. to do another show in a second, but I will say this, that like, I think what a lot of people react to here too is that there's just a tremendous power imbalance here. Now, I'm not like some lefty who's like, oh, if you have power, that means you're the oppressor, you're the bad one. No, people but do the react fact, to that. But the fact is that power does matter to some degree. And especially here as citizens of the United States of America, we have the most powerful government in the history of the world. I mean, a government that can literally snap its fingers and other governments don't exist if we wanted to. Um, we'd rather just overthrow the regime than nuke them, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and to use this power to look at every, because there's also lots of other chapters of this story where look, after 9-11, Colin Powell convinced George W. Bush that you got to go for a two-state solution right now. You got to go for a two-state solution. And there's been several American presidents who have insisted that this happen, and they are undercut at every chance. Like, it just does not end up going through. And usually, this is a lot to do, not as some on the internet might say with some Jewish conspiracy or something like that, what it usually has a lot more to do with is the tens of millions of evangelical Christians in this country who will fall in line with whatever... Um, the pro-Israel position is viewed as being. So I agree, I agree with a lot of what you said. And we've got to wrap it up. A concept I keep coming to lately is that of critical mass. The concept of critical mass in many, many um, contexts is very interesting. And there's an imbalance between Israel and the Arabs here. Because in most democracies, in Israel, in America, 51% if 51% of the public gets behind something, that's what's going to happen. And except for very rare exceptions, the country will stand behind that and other, and other leaders can depend on that. And that's what it is. What is the critical mass needed to support a peace treaty with Israel such that Israel can depend on it? Is it 95%? If 10% of a ruthless, bandit-led, corrupt, violent, Muslim fundamentalist outfit says, sure, we'll make peace with you. Israel's not going to risk it on that because the guy can get shot. They can break their word. They can, if Putin can sign a treaty and go over it, and, and believe me, they're keeping it. They, Israel sees Putin signs a treaty and then he broke the treaty because he was provoked and the world is now pressuring the, the Ukraine to take it. We're not fucking going to be Ukraine in this. So we need absolute certainty that our our security is is in stone how do we get that from hamas how do well, we get that from the pilot we can only get it by having peacekeepers well you know there's many things we need to have for that these are things that the palestinians didn't want reasonable people like tough love tough love on israel is good there needs to be some tough love in the opposite way too. say listen you have to understand they're never going to do it if you can't give them something that they can go in front of their voters. You don't have voters. They have to keep their voters safe. You might have to say, okay, for 40 years, for 10 years, for three years, you were going to allow it's this, just, we're going to allow that. If you think this, it's insane. And there's, there's but there has a, to be there's critical lot, mass. There's a lot to blame in the U.S. leadership for this, too, because whether I like it or not, we are the dominant force in the world and kind of a global empire. You don't like that? It's better than the alternative. <laughs> I disagree, but okay. Um, but... 
the fact that it's not just insisted that you could ever just accept like, oh, Oslo didn't work out, so whatever. We're just not going to do this again. Like it should be insisted that what? no, 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 you guys have to get back to the table. We I'm have to start over and start over and start, start over. But table. listen, I'll say that that might be true. I'll just say this, right? The idea that these people in Palestine are just so dangerous that Israel cannot take the boot off their neck because this is too much of a risk to themselves, that they cannot grant them their independent state because if they did that, then who knows what the result of that is. They, this, this, they can't have rockets coming from the West Bank. R- right. Well, they this, is what they, this is what they'll say. No, Listen, no, it's true. Radical, there is a, there is a real issue with radical Islam. Um, no question about it. And it's all throughout uh, the Islamic world or throughout much of the Islamic world. There's a real issue uh, with it. And, um, and my beef kind of is with my government for in propping up so much of it. But regardless of that, um, Israel has been at peace with Egypt since the 1970s. They've been at peace with Saudi Arabia since the 1970s. They've been at peace with Jordan since the 1970s, correct? Jordan never really had a problem with Israel. Right, even right, yes, <laughs> that's right. From, from the beginning, well, they were the ones who they were yeah, most yeah, kind of cool yeah. with early on. Um, all of these places have problems with radical Islam, the, the, but they also have their own independence. Well, Saudi- now, they have issues with Hezbollah in Lebanon where they occupied for a long time, and this was the resistance that built up there. But the geog- they have issues. They no. have, well, they have issues in Gaza, and they have issues in the West Bank. This is very directly related to the fact that they have occupied and dominated these people. And I, and what not, was the problem in '66? Well, hold on. I'm, well, okay, the '66 was only a couple decades removed. What was the what was the, well, pro- the problem? Hold on. What was the problem in the Second Intifada? Okay. Well, listen. Again, I do have to run here, so I, I go go through all of this. But the problem with '66 is that there was a lot closer to 1947 and 48. Second Intifada was right okay. after they tried to make peace. Yes. Uh, okay. They started Fair blowing enough. up all the Jews. There's if you want to ever get out of this situation, and how exactly we get to the next peace table, it's looking pretty tough right now. Can I ask you? And I would I would guess I think Hamas. And Likud kind of all have to go. Hopefully, there'd be a, a new, younger generation of leadership I, I where there would that. be a real will. But this cannot. Can this can't go on. No, can't forever. Can I ask you a hypothetical? Sure. I, I think yeah. You know, listen, the, the the best thing people could do for the Palestinians would be insist that they have elections, but they don't have elections. So well, they insisted that yeah, in two thousand five yeah. or six or whatever it was. So no, no right. one fine, but regular elections. I'm not yeah. one election in mm-hmm. fact of a dictator, of okay. a military dictatorship. I mean, if people say that the Palestinians want peace then obviously the first thing that needs to happen is that they need to be able to elect their leader that represents what they want, right? But um, here's my that question. That would be an improvement for sure, but yes. If, 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 if uh, and that people sus- you know, worry that Hamas could take over in the West Bank. If tomorrow rockets started coming in from the West Bank, hypothetically, which is not a crazy thing, Israel would probably then have to take huge measures to blockade the West Bank as well. Who knows what they would do? Um we wouldn't be able to blame them. But then five years from now, we'd forget and say, how dare Israel have this blockade? How like, And that's how this started in Gaza. At some point, there was no blockade. Well, okay. And the rockets came, and everybody at the time understood Israel's situation, and then they forgot about how it all started. I think it's a, you can pick your different points in history and decide who started it, and both sides are going to tell you the other one started it. And there's lots of instances in it throughout where both sides started it. Um, if you Listen, I, I get the point you're making. We I'm know Sharon wanted to pull out. I'm just saying it's, it's very one-sided to go like, well, if these rockets come in, what are they supposed to do? And why can't we also ask the same question about the Palestinians to say, living under the current state that they're living under right now, what are they supposed to do? Like, look, you already told me they, 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 you told me they maybe have a right to kill the IDF in the West Bank there, right? That they might, that the you're not exactly sure, right? So I'm just saying that for a lot of the pro-Israeli side will always ask, like, doesn't Israel have a right to exist? But the truth is that, of course they do. And they are existing right now, and they have a right to exist, and they have a right to defend themselves. The point is that the Palestinians also have a right to exist and defend themselves. And where exactly you draw that line is actually pretty damn murky. In, in a war, both and, sides— But for the record, I, they don't have a right to do October 7th, no, of, of course. And they—because they, you don't—because this is the Osama bin Laden logic that was like, oh, well, you elect your government, therefore innocent civilians are fair game to go murder. But that's just evil. And that's what we're all supposed to reject. I don't think that's their philosophy. Their philosophy is that we're trying to avoid as best we can 
uh, civilians, not that they... Attacked. No, 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 I'm talking about Hamas's attack on, okay. on October 7th, which was not... They were trying their best, yeah. but also if you read the new... Uh, what was it? The the 972 report. We don't have time to get into that, but some pretty uh, some pretty not good stuff in there. I don't trust that outfit, but it could be true. So, you know, yeah. you ha everybody has to... So come if that's true, the whole thing is that actually there have been instances of targeting uh, civilians. But uh, again, that's, uh, you know... Uh, you know, there's a history of these reports coming out and then, and then turning out not to be true. Massacre that is true. Made. Listen... Uh, that's Listen, that's on. one thing. Can I say that? It'll be the last thing I say, I promise. Yeah. Then I, I got to yeah. run. You could say a last thing. But that is also true. And it's something people should keep in mind that this it's not like sometimes in the fog of war, there are numbers or information or narratives or reports that turn out to be false. It's every time in the fog of war, there are things that turn out to be false. Like there are years later when they do the excess death rates, they get the, a much clearer picture of how many people died. The justifications for wars, what happened here, what happened there, a lot of that stuff. I'm not, by the way, don't infer from this that I'm saying like October 7th was some type of conspiracy or something. I'm just saying that a lot of this information, like look, everyone ended up looking stupid over that hospital attack when they were arguing for, day, not everyone, but when people were arguing for days over who blew up the hospital and then they figured out no one blew up the hospital. Um, so there's just a lot of stuff like that. Always remember that in the fog of war, information is, um, it's being channeled through two propaganda machines and then it's also people trying to figure things out in the middle of an act of war is pretty tricky. Y you have to watch The Gatekeepers. Have you seen it? I don't know. I don't you, think it's so. A, it's a documentary with interviews with all the former heads of the Shin Bet. And it, describes some pretty upsetting stuff. It's, it was considered a not a pro-Israel documentary. But one thing it does show... Was that about the 70... Uh, was that about the uh, Yom Kippur? No, it's not war? about any wars. Oh, okay. Not, Sorry. No, I you, confused you, it with something else. You'll yeah. be totally enthralled by this documentary. You should like watch it tonight because it's very, okay. very... But what does come through in it, this is without regard to, the, to any particular incident that might have happened where some fucking Israeli animal shot some civilian. I, of course, I'd be, I'd be an idiot to say that that can't happen. No, my people would never do that. Every people does that. Mm. At the highest levels, there was an incident when they had all the Hamas leadership in one building. They could have blown them up. Ariel Sharon, of all people, called it off because too many civilians would die. When you see that kind of thing, you you at some point you have to Put things in perspective. Israel is, is a country that m has civilians in the room, lawyers passing off on things, fueled by rage, human. And, you know, I used to say Obama, probably the first time he dropped a drone, was probably like sweating and I don't know, should I, should I? <laughs> and by the end, he was like watching the game, like, Mr. President, not now. I'm watching, yeah, yeah, bomb, go ahead. I'm watching the game. You know, you get used to killing. And I don't think Obama was a bad man. I think this is a deep weakness of human nature. I do, I but we can do that on another <laughs> I don't have. Episode. I have no doubt that Israelis get used to killing too. The first hundred civilians in Gaza that died probably gave them deep moral qualms. The last hundred, it's just they're used to it already. Yeah, and, sh and soldiers, particularly during the times where there was like a real military occupation, yeah. you know, soldiers are young men filled yeah. with piss and vinegar. And, and they, and and they, they are really into, in yeah, a race. This happens, yeah. But Israel is not an amoral... Uh, uh, country and Israel is not, and Israel has procedures. Israel has commissions afterwards. Ariel Sharon, who who was behind the, not behind it, but allowed the Sabra and yeah. Shatila massacre. You know about this. Mm -hmm. One of the worst. Case. He was called to task. There was an investigation. He was dressed down. He was he resigned. You know, like Israel is not. It, you know, there's going to be no Hamas commission to figure out what they allowed. Well, that's and didn't that's allow. for sure. But look, yeah. I mean, here, sorry, I, I love this. I swear. Are you going to come play at the club again now? I. Uh, uh, Possibly. I truthfully, uh, still I live. Mad. No, 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 I'm not mad. <laughs> still I just, mad. I don't really do city spots that much anymore. I got two little kids and I live like an hour well, outside of the city. But when you do, when, when I do, sure, yeah, yeah. I will come. Yes. Uh, but I'll just say this. And the last thing is that like a lot of times people like, um, and because there are people who are really like this, I get lumped into this category. But in the same sense that I think invading Iraq was totally wrong and unjustified and just heinous, that doesn't mean I'm like saying, America is the bad country and Saddam Hussein's Iraq is the good country or something like that, right? Not. So I'm just making the point that, look, it's amazing what Israel's created. It's incredible what the Zionists pulled off. Like you could, if you read the Theodore Herzl and just go like, he actually made this happen? Maybe Tucker Carlson's not point. crazy because Herzl but that's is crazy. insane, dude. <laughs> Can you imagine if you were just, like, it, just, it was just like a few guys with no backing at the time. I mean, they got some backing later, but like at the time had nothing and they pulled it off and they made And it, we're also going to bring a language out of the and dust. Look, Israel's a great place, a great place for people to live. People have built lives there and happy lives there. I would even argue that look for the, the Arab uh, citizens in Israel. 
probably the best place in the Middle East to just be a regular citizen if you're Arab would be in Israel. Um, that pro- almost no, no un- undoubtedly, right? Um, that can all be true. And what they're doing to the Palestinian people can still be totally unacceptable. So that's all that I'll say. I, yeah, that's I, my final uh, yeah, uh, thing, and I, I'm happy I, to talk I, more. I have said many times, there, there are two issues there. My difference with you is that I don't think they're, uh, I think they're correlation, not causation. The case, I said in one of my podcasts, if, my, if we lived in Israel and my daughter said, Daddy, I'm going to become a lawyer and I'm going to do pro bono work for the Palestinians on the way because the way they're fucking treated on the West Bank is an outrage and I want... I said, I'm, I'm very proud of you, sweetheart, of course, because of course they're getting treated badly. The, the very nature of the relationship with humans in authority, in, in you know, yeah. it, this, of course, like, it's like, it's police on steroids. And we believe in, we believe in yeah. unalienable rights, right? Yeah, yeah. We believe and, people have them. And the, and the, and the, I, and the, I mean, if, I just, I just know that this stuff, if 80% of it is true, that's tremendous amount of it. Where I part company is that I don't think it has or has ever had anything to do with the peace process. The peace process to me, from what I say, has been rejectionism. And people see these settlements and see the way they're treated and they think, oh, that's the reason there's no peace. No, that's the reason the Palestinians are being treated horribly by Israelis. And that is a real fucking issue. And I've never been someone who's really felt I, I could really get into that because I always assumed a whole amount of it is going to be true. I'm, I'm sure there's some incidents that are not true. It, it, I'm just saying, be very careful of thinking that it's the same issue. They can be totally separate. Hamas, West Bank, Arafat, Arafat's refusal to make peace. This wasn't because of settlements, not because of settlements. The 67 war wasn't because of settlements, not settlements. Sadat did not invade because of the settlements. Hamas is not invading because of the settlements. Hamas doesn't give a shit about the settlements. So, well, they, they moved the settlements from Gaza, right? So, uh, right, but I was saying, Hamas, Hamas is not invading on behalf oh, of yeah, the yeah, West yeah, Bank settlements. Okay, sure. if, if Israel didn't have a single settlement, Hamas would, would still be attacking Israel. So they are, it's, it's complicated. What's going on between Hamas and Israel is much more similar to what goes on between the Sunnis and the Shiites, the Shiites and the Wahhabis, the Wahhabis and the Alawites, the Alawites and the Christians, Saudi Arabia and, and uh, uh, Yemen. I mean, I don't even, you might know all these conflicts. Yes. This is tri- and, and none of these issues with way more bloodshed, Iran and Iraq, none of these issues ever had settlements, ever had occupation. Sure, no, they, a lot of them had American funding, one or both sides of them. But okay, the I, really, tri- I have to run. I'm the tribal hatred the alone was fuel enough. And oh, it continues no. to be fuel enough. All right, you're you were a great, great guest. Thank you guys very much for having me. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Noam. Right, 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 right.